Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Mara Walsh, and I'm just allowing people to come into the room at this point and get set up so that we're ready for our tour. It's about 7 o'clock p.m. here in Eastern Time, Pennsylvania is where I'm from. So I'm just going to give people a minute, but I want to thank everybody for being here. Okay, so let's move on. It's seven o'clock. Welcome. First, um, a few housekeeping items. Please know that all of you in attendance are muted and your videos are not being shown. You do have the chat um, and the Q&A tool to use to communicate. Um, this might be a little different than some Zoom meetings you're used to where you are being seen and heard, but in this case, you are not. Uh, audio. If you're having audio issues and you need to hear us better, there are three ways to address this. One, you can attach a device with a headset or earbuds to your device. Two, you can turn up your computer volume. Uh, or three, there's a little arrow next to the mic or microphone icon on the Zoom menu and you can change your audio output volume or your input volume at, in, in, that, um, in those audio settings. Uh, the screen. Right now you should see me in a small screen to your right if you're on a computer and then you see a large screen with the presentation slide. If um, you want to enlarge the presentation slide, there's a vertical toolbar. You can just take your mouse and move that toolbar all the way over to the right to make my window as small as possible and the presentation window as large as possible. If for some reason you are on a device, meaning an iPad or an iPhone, you can um, swipe left or right. And then that way you don't have to worry about looking at the presenter. You can look at the slide. Okay, so I think we're all optimized for the best viewing and listening result at this time. I'll share a little bit about myself. Again, my name is Mara Walsh. I am in the United States and it is 7 p.m. Eastern time for me. I live in um, Pennsylvania between Philadelphia and New York. I started leading physical tours with my tour partner EF Tours as a Girl Scout leader, taking girls and their families to international destinations every summer. I have since expanded my physical travel program and added adult only tours as well as family friendly tours. But in the recent months, since COVID-19, I have begun offering virtual tours. And there's a couple of reasons I started with these virtual tour series. One, I really wanted to support the tour director community during this time of no work um, because of travel restrictions. And two, I really wanted to keep the excitement of travel alive for my travel group and extend that opportunity to those who have learned about us um, through their friends and family and social media and other means. We've done several tours in the past months. Uh, if you've missed any and you're interested in accessing them, they are all recorded and available on my website, girltraveltours.com uh, backslash virtual dash tours. I will chat that link so that you can access them as you would like. We have several tours coming up in the next weeks, including the Highlands of Scotland, Alaska, Vienna, Berlin, Canadian Rockies. Um, and then in the new year, we're gonna look at Gaudi's Barcelona, Amsterdam, Florence and Tuscany, a World War II European tour, um, Scandinavia, Santa Fe, uh, Switzerland, Iceland, a mystery on the Orient Express, a, a look at the troubles in Northern Ireland and more. So you can see we're always adding to our list and we're always trying to give you some different tours in the weeks to come to keep you interested and to keep you excited about traveling. As long as you're interested in viewing these tours, we will continue to produce them. My tour director friends are happy to be engaged in this type of way that they haven't been in more than a year. So they're ready and willing to share their expertise with their regions with us. Uh, register for future tour presentations through my website. There's a virtual tour drop down menu and you could just click on that and you'll see all of the tour lineup. Okay, today I know we have a lot of excitement to explore Japan, but before we get going, I want to share with you a few ways for you to interact with us. 
you can feel free to chat with me at any time. The chat is not going to be um, shared with the audience, but if you need um, a response or if you have a question, you can use the chat mechanism on Zoom. And um, if you want, if, if you have a question about the tour or the tour director, uh, and you want it to be addressed after the tour in the Q&A, please share that in the question, the Q&A um, tool, and those questions will be addressed after the tour. I'm always looking to interact in some way with our audience, so I'm going to launch a poll right now, and this poll will give us an understanding of your uh, connection with Japan. So what's your connection with Japan? I've been and I love it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I have current, I don't have current plans, but may be interested, or I'm solely interested in traveling virtually. Now, if I, I can't do the poll, but if I were, I would say I have a trip booked. I have a group going to Japan in 2023. We are very excited to do this tour. And this is one of the reasons why I reached out to Marty so that we could um, do a pre-cursor to our tour so that we could see it virtually and get even more excited. So I'm gonna share the results. Um, right now, it looks like we have about, 33% that say they're planning on going in the future. Um, there's a small percent that have a trip booked. I hope they're all booked with me. Um, and then there's a, a, a large contingency of people that are here for virtual, virtual tours or that they don't have current plans, but they could um, in the future. I know there's a lot of people out there that just love Japan and you are with us today. So thank you for coming. Um, and we're going to dive right in. So regardless of how connected you are with Japan before tonight, I know that tonight's presentation will enhance that for you and you'll be so excited about Japan in the future. So a tour wouldn't be complete without a fantastic tour director. A tour director is like a personal travel concierge who stays with your group from start to finish and shares a world of knowledge, manages all your travel plans and makes sure your experience is stressless and full of positive experiences, allowing you to make the lifelong memories and have a blast. These are by far the most important people in your group. And if we're not traveling, these tour directors have no work and most of them have not worked in, in a year now. So it's been rather tough for them. So I encourage you to leave a tip for the tour director if you enjoy this virtual tour. I will share with you via chat um, during the Q&A and along, uh, as we go along the tour, the many ways that you can leave a tip. I'm hoping that this virtual tour will not only reignite our desire to travel, but allow a tour director to do what she does best and share her knowledge and passion for, her, for travel and her adopted country, Japan. Before I hand over the presentation to our tour director, um, I know many of you are out there on Facebook who have joined us for this streaming live. And I just want to warn you, I just have been adding this in in the recent weeks because we've had so many scammers on the Facebook pages and they also have been doing a lot of copycats uh, where they copy an event or a, a page and they try to lure you in to give credit card information. Please, please, please never ever give your credit card to enter a free event. My virtual tour presentations do not require credit cards to join and you can always safely access my events through my website, girltraveltours.com or from my Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash girltraveltours. It's hard to know because they are good at copying things and they really do, um, they really do make it look like it's mine. But if that's the case and you're worried about that, please just go through my website and you'll know that you're, you're accessing our tour safely. Okay, so back to our virtual tour. Um, and I know it's time, everybody's waiting to, for me to hand over the, the presentation. So today I am honored to introduce you to and hand over this event to our amazing tour director and my new friend in Japan, Marty Robinson, who joins us from Kyoto, Japan. So welcome, I know it's early in the morning for you, Marty, and I'm sure that you have your coffee lined up to get you through this, but thank you very much for joining us for breakfast. Thanks and for I'm having me. To you. So take it away. Sure. 
Hello, my name is Marty Robinson. I've been living in Kyoto for the past seven years or so. My gosh, time goes by so quickly. See, I'm gonna share the presentation now. I also have a BA in Japanese studies, if that wasn't nerdy enough for you. We are about to go into a bit of a deep dive into Japan. So this is Japan. Um, I would hope you know, but the language of Japan is Japanese. So I put some Japanese throughout the slides if anyone wanted to challenge themselves. Without much further ado, let's just get right into it. So today, we're mostly just going to focus on sort of the main island of Japan called Honshu. So I'll give a quick introduction of the geography of the country, where is Japan, some of that background information, and then we'll go to Osaka first. And from there, we'll head to Hiroshima, Nara, Kyoto, Hakone, which is where Mount Fuji is, and we'll end in Tokyo. At the end, I'll put in some food and fun facts for you all before the Q&A. All right, so first of all, where is Japan? So Japan is an island country surrounded by ocean. On the west side of the country, you have the Sea of Japan. And if you go further south, you also have the East China Sea. And then on the east side of the country, you have the Pacific Ocean. If you keep going east, you will eventually run into North America. Now, as you can see, there's no land borders, but uh, Russia and South Korea are very close. Um, the country is also very heavily forested. It's actually about 66% is forest, although most of it is not old growth forest. There was a lot of deforestation in the medieval period and then again during World War II in the colonial period for industrialization. And it's also very mountainous. So it's actually more than 70% of the country is mountain. So as a result, the urban centers tend to be very concentrated and very dense in the small areas that are not too mountainous. And as you can see, it's a very long and narrow country. So I guess it might be hard to tell from this map the actual size and length. And also this map that kind of cuts off the bottom part of the country, which is the Okinawa um, islands and Amami islands, etc. There's more than 6,000 islands. But the country as a whole, if you're comparing it to the US, it actually spans pretty much the entire length of the East Coast from Maine all the way to Florida. So that means there's a lot of climate differences. So all the way up in the Northern Island, Hokkaido, you get humid continental all the way to a bit of the taiga climate all the way in the north there. And then the main island, Honshu, the upper half is also humid continental, but the southern half, which is where all the places we're going today will be focused on, is almost all considered humid continental climate. There's 6,852 islands, although most of them are not inhabited. So the four main ones, which you can see here, would be Honshu, which is the biggest island. That's where the capital Tokyo is. We have Hokkaido in the north. And then we have Kyushu and Shikoku. Now, can't forget about Okinawa. So Kyushu, that one of the four main islands, off the southern tip of it, you have an island chain and you can see Okinawa there. And you can see Japan actually goes pretty far south and it gets pretty close to Taiwan actually. And you have the East China Sea and the Philippine Sea as well. Now, today we're going to be going from Osaka, which is here. And we'll take the Shinkansen virtually to Hiroshima. And then we'll go to the old capitals of Nara and Kyoto. And end on a famous stop of the Tokaido, which was an ancient highway that connected Kyoto to Tokyo, Hakone, see Mount Fuji, and end in Tokyo. 
All right, so our first stop, Osaka. Today, Osaka is a very urban city. It's quite dense. It has the ocean on one side, so it has the port on one side, and then on the back side, there are mountains that surround it. But the city itself is pretty much just in a flat plain. Now, being by the ocean, this has made it a very important place of trade and economic importance throughout history. In fact, historians also believe Osaka might have been one of the first capitals of Japan. They have found a lot of evidence showing that some of the more ancient emperors before there was a written history have taken up their residence in what's now current day Osaka prefecture. And then the capital continued to sort of move northward from there. Now, saying Osaka, I think one of the major points is Osaka Castle. Now, I know it looks pretty cool, pretty nifty, but it's not the original. I hate to break the news to you. The original was this. So uh, the castle now is white. It actually used to be a black castle, but the location is the same. And this castle was sort of built at the end of what's known as the Warring States period. So in Japan, you have a lot of these different periods of history. We're not going to get into the whole thing, but pretty much from the 1400s to the early 1600s, there's about 200 years of all out civil war. Game of Thrones has nothing on this. And at the end, you get these three sort of leaders that kind of outsmart everyone else and win. And one of those was a man by the name of Hideyoshi Toyotomi. And before him was a guy named Oda Nobunaga. So Oda Nobunaga also had a black castle. It wasn't in Osaka. And he was sort of the first winner to come out of this. And Hideyoshi was Nobunaga's sort of number one right-hand man. And, you know, being his number one right-hand man and it being the medieval period, he then set up the assassination of Oda Nobunaga. So Oda Nobunaga ends up committing suicide. There's a huge betrayal. Hideyoshi then kills the guy who helped kill Nobunaga and then he made himself the leader of Japan. Hideyoshi is interesting because he didn't actually have sort of the family heritage. He wasn't of like the samurai heritage like these other people. So he was never allowed to be called the official warlord or the shogun but he is the first one who is said to have brought the country together. And then to just really show up, he built a castle in Nobunaga's image in Osaka. So that's where he wanted to really centralize in. Now, the castle itself was finished in 1597 and Hideyoshi Toyotomi died pretty much right after that. So he never really got a chance to live there, but hey, if you never have a chance to see it done, he never have a chance to see it burned to the ground and burned to the ground it did because as soon as he died, his number one right-hand man, the third great unifier of Japan, Tokugawa Ieyasu, decided to then do exactly what Hideyoshi had done to his master before him and betray his entire family. Uh, so Hideyoshi's son had inherited the castle. Tokugawa only had respect for Hideyoshi Toyotomi for his military genius, but not for the rest of the family. And he pretty much fought a whole bunch more battles. There's a very big deciding battle called the Battle of Sekigahara. And after that, he comes back to Osaka to take the last stronghold, which was this castle. And pretty much the castle itself was very well built, pretty much impenetrable. So they couldn't raid the castle. So they sieged it and they had to do that twice. Despite being outnumbered, the Hideyoshi family did ward them off the first time, the second time they weren't so lucky and they were all made to commit suicide. Suicide happens a lot in Japanese history. So after that, the castle is burned to the ground and buried. So recently they've discovered the original castle was buried underneath the current castle and he built another castle on top of it, this one. However, Fire is another big theme in Japan. So in the 1660s, twice, 1660, 1665, we got two lightning strikes that caught the castle on fire again, got rebuilt again, 
And then people kind of got tired of the Tokugawa family ruling Japan for so long. So about 200 years later, there was another rebellion that sort of kicked out the samurai and put the emperor back in power in 1868. And they went back to Osaka Castle to sign a peace treaty. And once that was signed, they burned down the castle again for good measure, just to make a point. After that, during the Meiji period, so that's the period right after the Tokugawa samurai, the castle actually became a military training ground and military headquarters. And you can actually see the building that was the headquarters is actually still on the grounds of the castle and it's a hotel now. But due to the American air raid, since the castle was a military base and surrounded by ammunition factories, it made it the perfect target for the American army and it burned down. Again, I cannot, I don't even know how many times it burned down at this point, it's a lot. But after the smoke cleared from the battle, uh, the people of Osaka, I think the castle has always had a special place in everybody's heart. So it did end up getting rebuilt with tax money collected from the city. And so in 1995, it was rebuilt again. And sorry about that. Um, I just spilled my coffee. So it is now rebuilt with a beautiful glass elevator on the outside, to give it a bit of a modern flair. But the walls actually are the second original still. They have survived the bombing. And for the people of Osaka, they would probably say Hideyoshi is the one true owner of the castle. Moving on, not too far, because the city's not that big, we have Dotonbori Canal. This is the big downtown area. So for those of you who like shopping and bright neon lights and food, this is the place to go. A lot of people don't know that it's also connected to the castle and that the canal itself, it was built by a merchant actually, or mostly built by a merchant in the early 1600s by a man named Doton, which is why it's called Doton. Bori Canal. However, sadly, during the siege of Osaka that took down the castle, he was sadly killed in the fighting. However, his family completed it for him and named it after him. It's very famous for its running man. Definitely a sight to see. I would prefer to go at night because that's when all the lights are on. It's pretty fun. And also on the south side of the city, we have a place called Shinsekai, which is the New World. Now, in 1912, this actually used to be a theme park called Luna Park, and it was supposed to be modeled half after Paris, France, and half after Coney Island. Um, I'm not sure how close I actually got to replicating those areas. However, you can see the tower in the back of the picture that says Hitachi on it. So that's called the Tsutenkaku Tower. And before World War II, this tower was supposedly the second tallest structure in Asia at the time. And if you look at it now, it doesn't look that, that tall, but at the time it was number two. However, during World War II, this whole south part of Osaka, this is where a lot of the industry was, so it did get heavily bombed and heavily damaged, including the tower. So the tower is also not the original and then this area sort of got ignored for a while the theme park had to be closed because of the war and the area ended up getting a bit of a bad reputation for being a bit of a seedy area however this is sort of the home of a lot of the blue collar culture blue collar food and they're really famous for these big flashy signs however the most famous one here which is the fugu fish lantern thanks to COVID-19 is no longer one of the greatest casualties lost to the disease. The restaurant had to close because people were social distancing. So apparently this will probably not be there anymore, sadly. Also in Shinsekai, you have this scary guy here. He is the master of kushikatsu, which is pretty much anything deep fried and breaded on a stick. And 
Osaka, specifically that area, Shinsekai claims to have invented breaded and deep fried things on a stick. And when you go to these restaurants, they'll have like the bowl of sauce for you to dip it in, but it's a communal bowl of sauce that everyone has to dip it in. So double dipping is strictly forbidden. Don't double dip, bad thing. And the other thing that I really like about this area is that you can find lots of these little retro places. So one of those places are these really old school game arcades. They probably have the original Street Fighter and Mario anything else you can imagine. But they walls, I think they used to be white, but due to all the chain smoking that has taken place in here, the whole place is just yellow now. But they're still a great place to visit if you're into that sort of thing. Of course, just to finish up, Osaka we got the most famous food octopus balls or takoyaki. So this is a very famous street food. I'm going to apologize to everyone on the east side of Japan, but I'm about to badmouth all of y'all, but Osaka makes the best takoyaki. The outside is crispy. The, outs the, the inside, it kind of melts in your mouth. Um, I know some people are turned off by the idea of eating octopus, but it's a very small piece and it's not chewy at all. And of course, the top, you get a generous amount of what is just known as the sauce, which is a big mainstay in Osaka and street food, the sprinkling of mayonnaise and fish flakes. Although if you don't like mayonnaise or fish flakes, they usually let you get them without. Moving on from there, you can hop on the Shinkansen. I'm very jealous of all of those who can go on a tourist visa and get the Japan Rail Pass, which allows you to take the Shinkansen pretty much an unlimited number of times wherever you want to go for just one set price for a period of time. They're really fun. It's a really convenient way to get around the country. And you can take it to pretty much all the major cities of Mensum. So there is a stop in Hiroshima. Now, I know Hiroshima is the most famous for the atomic bomb, but I thought we would talk about some other aspects of the city first. The first sort of going off of the food uh, from where we ended Osaka is the cabbage pancake called okonomiyaki. It literally means as you like it. Now, some years ago, Japan had a competition to see which prefecture made the best okonomiyaki in the country. And also, up until that point, you know, Osaka was very confident that theirs was the best in the country, but Hiroshima beat them. So I actually have a picture of both. So the one on the left, the rounder ones, those are the Osaka style. That's where you sort of mix the batter and the cabbage and everything together. And then you like, pan fry it. Whereas the Hiroshima style, it's more like a crepe where you, the batter, it's a very thin batter, like a crepe batter. And you put that down first and you put the cabbage and everything else on top of it and then flip it over. And, you know, I'm sorry, Osaka. Food is very good in Osaka, but I have to say the Hiroshima one is subjectively better. That's very biased of me to say. And in fact, Hiroshima is the absolute legend when it comes to okonomiyaki that they also have the number one best-selling and also subjectively the best okonomiyaki sauce. So if you ever go to Japan, you, it, it kind of tastes like a cross between like barbecue sauce, maybe a little Worcestershire sauce, but it's good. It's really good. If you're making okonomiyaki at home and you don't have access to the lovely Otafuku brand okonomiyaki sauce, um, I guess you could replace it with regular barbecue sauce. It'll be a little different, but you, know, you got to make do with what you have. Come to Japan, go to Hiroshima and have the original, the best. From there, so there's a very famous shrine in Hiroshima that's considered one of the most scenic places in Japan. There's three. This is one of them. This is a picture that many of you have probably seen online somewhere where it's the 
you can see the gates in the ocean. Those are called Tori gates. It's a Shinto shrine. So Shinto is one of the two main religions of Japan. The other is Buddhism. We'll get into Buddhism a bit later, but Shintoism is more like the folk religion of Japan, if you will. Um, I guess it's more centralized now, but it didn't always used to be that way, especially in the, there's so much we don't know because there's the prehistorical period where nothing was written down. But even where I live, which is just uh, south of Kyoto city, which is a small town that used to be more of a farming town, it's definitely more urban now. But if you go to the mountains where I live even, it's said that there's a goddess in the mountain and she has her own like really, really small shrine. And it's all just been an oral tradition that's been passed down and she's not in any of the official Shinto texts, but she's there and apparently she's very jealous of women so only men are allowed to visit her shrine, but that's a story for another time. But Itsukushima shrine uh, is for one of the main characters, if you will, from the Shinto pantheon. A lot of people compare it to Greek mythology because when it did get written down, it got written down in the 400s AD. It was one of the first like sort of Japanese texts that wasn't written in Chinese because until that point, Japan, before the writing system, it all the writing system and all that came from China, but Chinese, the language is very different from Japanese grammatically and also phonetically. However, sort of like how Latin in Europe became the lingua franca for a bit, especially among the elite, Classical Chinese became the lingua franca of the elite in Japan, and things used to be written just in classical Chinese all the time. However, there's, there's sort of two books, uh, the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki, and both of them are a compilation of mythology and history of Japan that sort of legitimize the imperial family as being descended from the sun goddess Amaterasu, and also say how Japan was created by the gods Izunami and Izunagi. There's all sorts of these stories and crazy characters. Now, Itsukushima Shrine is there sort of to uh, enshrine the three daughters of the thunder god Susano, who's um, very temperamental because he's a thunder god and he likes to smite people down with lightning and stuff. But his daughters are often associated with the ocean. So it's sort of like, protection for voyages on the water. Now, not only is the shrine itself have the three goddesses, the island itself is also considered a god. So the concept of what is a god or a goddess in Shintoism, I think is a little different than maybe the uh, Abrahamic religions where you have the one god that's omnipresent and omnipotent, whereas the gods in Shintoism or the deities uh, a lot of the time they can be more representative of things. Of course, you get the characters as well, but it's a little, yeah, it's a little different. Now the shrine is actually the reason it's built in the ocean like this is because the original builders, they didn't want to upset the island god that much. So it's built like this and the originals from it's thought to be from around 593. Can't really put a hard and fast date on it, but the main one that we know about was rebuilt again by a samurai family called the Taira. Now the Taira family, oh my gosh, can, there's just so much drama with them. So they were sort of formed. So there's four families. The Taira were one of them. And these were families that were formed because the imperial family couldn't really get it together when it came to who becomes the next emperor. So there are lots of succession disputes. So sons that they didn't want to become the next emperor were sort of banished into these commoner families, but not really because they were still nobility and they gotta be warlords and stuff eventually. So the Taira was one, the Fujiwara were another, and eventually the, the Fujiwara became very powerful. So remember, the Fujiwara were all people who were from the imperial family line. And then what they did is they married all their daughters back into the main line. And so they became very powerful that way. 
in the Tyra, of course, they also wanted a bit of the power. So they tried to do the same thing. Eventually there was a rebellion and they had a bit of a coup sort of, and they became the most powerful family, the most powerful warlords in the country. And Hiroshima was actually one of the places that they really focused on as one of their sort of bases of power. And so they built this shrine to show off how much money they had. Like they had, they made it their own pretty much private island and only special people could go there. Um, However, the guy who built it, Tyre Kiyomori, he was sort of the height and the downfall of the whole family. So I didn't know it'll last that long. So it, there was another war and it got burned down a few more times. Another warlord took over it. And then there was another war. And so in Shintoism, um, it doesn't really say in Shintoism, like thou shall not kill or thou shall not do this. But there is this sort of code of purity and uh, killing someone on a sacred ground, that's a big no-no. So blood, death, big no. So the the guy who rebuilt it after Tyre Mori, because there was a battle on the island, it was sort of considered tainted. So then they burned it down on purpose this time and it did get rebuilt, but they rebuilt it in the style of the 12th century Tyra. So it's very lots of drama. They've probably made a movie about it at some point. <laughs> now, one more fun fact about it though is that from 1878 onwards, no one is allowed to die and no one is allowed to give birth on the island. And somehow they've managed to enforce that, which I thought was brilliant. Also on the island, there's lots of deer. They're very cute mostly showing this to you because we're going to transition into something a lot more depressing now, which is the atomic bomb. So this image here is sort of called known as the Genbaku Dome. Uh, a lot of people think that it is the actual ground zero, but it's actually about 150 meters away from where the bomb actually hit. But due to its steel reinforced concrete structure, it managed to not completely disintegrate. The actual ground zero where the bomb fell was 800 meters away from where they wanted it to blow up. The, apparently the original target was more of where the factories were, but it actually blew up over a hospital, pretty much the one main hospital in the city and it killed more than 90% of all of the doctors and nurses in the entire city. Um, so that was not good. On top of that, in the initial blast, about 70,000 to 80,000 people died pretty much immediately or from the firestorm that ensued after the blast. And another 70,000 to 80,000 were injured. However, out of those many also died in the coming weeks because they had received either a lethal dose of radiation or because their burns were so bad and because there just wasn't enough uh, medical personnel. If the volunteers were able to come relatively quickly, but sepsis does not wait for anyone. I have a picture here. So this is the city right before the bombing. And this is the city after the bombing. So it pretty much decimated everything in its path. And one third of the population died. Now, after Japan surrendered. The United States occupied Japan. So a lot of people don't know that uh, the US actually, they literally did occupy Japan. And they censored a lot of the information about the atomic bomb within Japan. And they didn't just censor the information, they censored also the word censor. So people weren't allowed to say that they were censoring things or put like little X's and the words they weren't allowed to say. Uh, so outside of the people who were actually in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, people 
they would see maybe pictures like this, like the aerial view, but the more personal pictures and personal stories, you know, photos of the actual victims were heavily censored. Even though a lot of them actually got shown in the US eventually, because the US didn't censor things in the US. But it wasn't until after the occupation that a lot of these images and stories start to come out. And another main thing of the censorship campaign really was to prevent the spread of information about the effects of radiation. So this caused a lot of misinformation. So a lot of people, like people know that many people died from the radiation who got the lethal dose, but people who were maybe outside the city or protected who did not get a lethal dose, yes, some of those people um, ended up suffering later from autoimmune disorders or leukemia or bone cancers. However, a lot of people who were on the outskirts of the city or outside of the city, even though they were exposed to more radiation than normal, it wasn't as much as some people were, like it, it wasn't as bad as some people were saying, but I don't want to downplay how bad it was because this is absolute tragedy. So as a result of this, uh, there's a term called hibaksha, which is like those who are victims of the bomb. And that almost sort of became like a bad word. So people who are from Hiroshima or people who, you know, had severe burns or were injured, regardless of whether or not they had radiation sickness or anything else related to it, uh, actually faced discrimination within Japan. So it would have trouble maybe finding a marriage partner. Uh, there's the belief that the hibaksha uh, would only give birth to babies who are heavily deformed and uh, science has pretty much debunked this like the people who are from Hiroshima give birth to healthy babies at pretty on um, pretty much the same rate as the rest of the population so it's just quite the time so now if you go to Hiroshima so the site of where the atomic bomb was there is I highly recommend everyone goes at least once I think everyone who goes ends up crying. I definitely cried a lot one time I went there. It's the Hiroshima Peace Museum. And it's a collection of all of the stories, everything that happened that day. Of the people who were there, who were survivors and witnessed it, they, there was no warning. It was just, you know, a regular sunny morning. Uh, There's no pamphlet, nothing saying that the city was about to experience like the most devastating bomb in human history, pretty much. So there was no time for people to leave the city, evacuate the city or take shelter. And sometimes I wonder if there was a warning and people did have time to leave, would the casualties have been a lot less? Uh, you also will see it this as well. These are paper swans, so, or cranes. I always call them swans, they're cranes. So maybe some of you have heard this before, the 1,000 paper swans. Uh, there's a story actually from the aftermath of the atomic bomb of a child named Sasaki Sadako. And she was a child when the bomb went off and eventually as a result, she actually got leukemia and so she was deathly ill in the hospital, but she tried to make, she tried to fold 1,000 swans, sort of in the belief that getting to 1,000, you know, could help maybe with recovery or getting better. But sadly, she didn't quite finish and she passed away October 15th, 1955 at just 12 years old. For those who, want to do further reading or research, there's lots of materials out there. Uh, I'm going to put two books out there. Uh, one is a comic book actually called Barefoot Gen, which is written by a survivor. I think the first book is closer to his real experience, but as he goes on, uh, he gets more into the character, but he bases everything off of his real life. So uh, it's about Again, in his family, and the you know how they were living before the bomb went off, and what happened after the bomb, and the journey afterwards. I really recommend everyone give it a read. Another one here is called Summer Flowers. So this one is 
a bit heavier. So this one is the, the personal experiences of Hara Tamiki. So I really suggest everyone read. Uh, the author also wrote this beautiful poem, which I'm going to quote here. It's called, This is a Human Being. So this is a human being. See how the autumn bomb has changed it. The flesh is terribly bloated. Men and women all taking the same shape. Ah, uh, help me, the quiet words of the voice that escapes, the swollen lips in the festering face. This is a human being. This is a human face. So, it's taking a moment after that. Uh, moving on, we're going to head to Nara. Nara is, well, the capital, the old capital of the city is just north of Osaka. This was the first permanent capital of Japan, meaning that it lasted for more than one emperor. Before that, every time an emperor passed away, the capital moved. This had to do a lot with Shinto beliefs because the emperor was sort of like a living deity. So the death of a deity was just not good at all. So then the capital would be moved. However, this all changed with the spread of Buddhism, which Nara is one of the main places that happened. Now, Nara is also famous for the deer. The deer are very cute and very greedy. You can feed them. A lot of people like to go there for the deer. But the most famous place in Nara is the temple called Todaiji Temple. It's actually the largest wooden structure in the world. And it's at also only one third the size of the original and it's still the largest wooden structure in the world, which is just crazy. Absolutely massive. And this temple is from 752. So the Nara was the capital from 710, uh, arguably until about 784 or so. And in the 730s, there was just a lot of bad stuff that happened. So you had smallpox that just devastated the population. You had more family infighting but with those off branch families and the imperial family again. So war and also famine because for some reason the crops just weren't growing as well. So usually in times of hardship, people turn to religion and the 700s, these were the some of the main times for the Silk Road in Japan. So a lot of people know the Silk Road, they think of maybe Marco Polo and things going from the what's present day, you know, Middle East to China and back. But actually the Silk Road, uh, some people argue it's went from all the way from Venice, Italy to Greece, Turkey, um, present day, you know, Iran, Central Asia, India, China, and then it also kept going through the, well, like kind of branched off to through Southeast Asia, then through Korea, and then it actually ends in Japan. So Nara was sort of at the height of this, so it became this huge metropolis. And you had people from all over the world coming to Nara. And Nara was sending lots of people to go abroad and leave Japan and experience the world and bring back all sorts of new things and knowledge and treasure. So at, in Nara, actually, they have found and like there's a treasure house behind this temple. And inside, they actually found sort of instruments from the Middle East and India. And some had actual like camels, camels on it. Camels do not live in Japan, by the way. I mean, there's some now like that were brought in for who knows what, but they, they're not, they're not from Japan. They don't, they don't like live in the wild in Japan at all. And they've also found these beautiful glass works that were not in a Japanese style. And they've also have found roof tiles that have a more Greek and Hellenistic flair. So it was really multicultural. And this temple pretty much bankrupted Japan, <laughs> not gonna lie. They, there was just such a need to show off the wealth and power. And they brought in people from India, actually. They actually brought in a Buddhist monk from India 
to sort of anoint this temple. And according to the records, about 2 million people helped to build this temple. Nara City does not have 2 million people living in it today. But the people they have on that list, it's, you know, it's not just the carpenters and people who put it together, but it's also the people who, you know, helped uh, keep everyone fed, give everyone food. And inside the temple is this giant Buddha. The picture does it no justice for size. Uh, this is a cast iron, uh, sorry, bronze. So it's a bronze Buddha. And it's really interesting how they made it. So they, they did make the clay sculpture first and then they cast it in different parts and then put it all together again. Uh, at one point the head did fall off, but they did replace it. Now the temple itself was not free from fire and warfare and all that. So it did burn down, but thankfully the metal did not melt. And the current temple is from the medieval period. The time of Tokugawa Shogun, the guy who also burned down the Osaka castle, his family rebuilt a lot of things after they burned it all down. Now moving on, so Nara wasn't the capital for that long. Kyoto, on the other hand, was the capital for more than 1,000 years. So Kyoto's uh, just north of Nara. Nara is in a big open plain, which makes it an easy target for anyone who's not happy with the way of the land. Whereas Kyoto is in a valley and surrounded by mountains and rivers and has all of these natural fortifications that make it great. But Kyoto was actually not the original plan for the capital after Nara. Uh, originally, they moved the capital just a little south of present day Kyoto in a place called Nagaoka Kyo. So you see Kyo a lot. So there's Kyoto, right? So there's Tokyo. So that Kyo, it means capital. And Nagaoka Kyo was another capital that everyone has forgotten about that because it was only the capital for 10 years because so many bad things happened. So apparently the temple, we will back slide, this temple got way too powerful and was getting way too involved in politics for the imperial family's liking. So they thought we're going to move away and hopefully that will make the temple less popular or we'll go to Kyoto or not Kyoto then, Nagoka Kyo. So they moved there and just all these bad things happened. So the, the emperor almost suffers from an assassination attempt, which includes his own brother as one of the co-conspirators. So he exiles his brother. However, his brother, the disgraced prince, dies in transit somehow to his exile location. And we don't know if he starved himself to death or if he killed himself or if he was just sick. No one really knows exactly how he died, but pretty much the emperor did not give him a proper funeral. And apparently this upset the dead brother's spirit. So then lots of bad things started to happen. There's bad weather, there's disease. Other people of the imperial family just started dying. And it was just like, okay, the dead spirits, they're out to get us. We can't stay here. Bad. Uh, thankfully, one of the people from one of those families that branched off from the imperial family, the Fujiwara family, at the time in the 700s, were sort of at the getting towards, inching towards the peak of their bureaucratic power. And one of them said that they had a vision of this place that was naturally fortified in a great location. It has like four guardians, the mountains and the lakes and the rivers great place. That place turned out to be Kyoto. They moved there and they made the city. So I know it's all a lot of Japanese text, but I will simplify it. So you can see the grid, the, the clean cut grid, the one that's computer generated. And on the top, there's a big yellow square. So that's the north side of the city. The city used to be very small. It's actually based off of Xi'an in China, which was the Tang dynasty capital at the time, the contemporary capital. And so uh, the emperor wanted to be just as powerful as the Chinese emperor and was like, well, we're going to start by having a city just like China. And so they built Kyoto. And the big yellow square, that was the imperial palace called the Dai Daidi. And that's where they lived. And going to the south, you can see at the very bottom, the two green rectangles. So because 
when they, they were running away from the power of the almighty Todaiju Temple in Nara, they actually had a, a law at first that banned almost all Buddhist temples in the city, except for two, to protect the one and only entrance that wasn't fortified, which is in the south. So they had the West Temple and the East Temple, and they were just called that, the East and West Temple. <laughs> so Nishi is West and Higashi is East. And the East Temple doesn't exist anymore, but you can still visit Toji, which is the East Temple. And right to the south of that, there's like some red text. That's the Rashomon or Rajomon. Depends who you are and how you want to write it. But that was the original gate. That used to be the only way in and out of the city. However, this sort of control freak plan didn't really work and like everything, it just sort of degraded over time, especially the gate. The gate didn't last long. <laughs> People did not like to be confined. But it does sort of get a bit of a reputation because the people on the north side of the gate were the official residents, the people on the south, not so official residents, and where that came some stigma. Uh, speaking of the gate, there is a wonderful novel and movie of the same name, La Chaumont. It doesn't actually have much to do with the gate itself, but it is a period of peace that takes place mostly in the period of the early days of the capital. And it's a classic film by this a wonderful director, Kurosawa. So for those who are into Japanese filmography, I highly recommend you watch his stuff. And moving on, Kyoto was famous in Kyoto other than shrines and temples. So unlike Osaka and Hiroshima, in many other places. Uh, Kyoto actually did not suffer any bombing dur during World War II. That's not to say things didn't burn down a lot before World War II for other reasons. However, as a result, a lot of medieval architecture has been very well preserved in Kyoto in particular. So this is one of the most famous ones. This is another Shinto shrine, not a Buddhist temple. This one is called Shimi Inari. So this is the one with all those wonderful Tori gates that sort of go up the mountain. And many people say these Tori gates, they're sort of like the gate from our sort of mortal, normal world into the world of the gods. So usually at the entrance of a shrine, you have the Tori gate and you go through it. But here it's like a tunnel. So it's almost like you're being transported to a different world rather than just entering into a shrine. And of this, you'll see at the shrine as well, the fox. So these Inari shrines, so this is for the rice goddess, actually. And the earliest record of the shrine is 711 AD. So this predates the capital of Kyoto. Kyoto only became the capital in 794. And it wasn't that popular at first because, you know, the rice goddess, like that's just, you know, for the peasants and the farmers who, who make the rice. So, it didn't get a lot of attention until the new tax system came about later in the medieval period, earlier medieval period, where you pay taxes with rice. So you'd have your little feudal fiefdom and you would pay with rice. So rice became synonymous with money and wealth. And as a result, many wealthy people started to be very interested in this rice goddess and donated lots of money to the shrine. And it became a very prosperous. And in fact, the shrine is massive. It's like the entire mountain and it's the largest of its type, but you see Inari shrines everywhere. And with Shintoism, unlike with the Buddhist temples where you always have usually some representation either of the Buddha or one of the many bodhisattva uh, in their human form in the temple, you don't see that inside shrines. Uh, that's sort of because the sort of the best things are best kept hidden. And you will see animals though sometimes. So the rice goddess is often associated with this sort of mythical fox here. And the fox is not her, it's actually sort of like her messenger. But often the fox will be holding, you know, either the scroll to like the rice, like the rice storage room or, you know, the jewel. Jewel is one of the symbols sort of of the imperial family. And since they're associated with the Shinto gods, it's all sort of connected. So I see them a lot. Uh, one other thing, you see the writing on the back of all the Tory gates. A lot of people think that it is some words of wisdom, but they are actually just the company names of the companies who are 
hoping to be blessed by the rice goddess and get lots of money in the next year. Another famous spot is Kyomizure Temple. Wow, that's a lot of people <laughs> um, in the picture. So this is a, another temple that sort of predates uh, the capital itself from 778. And the entire structure, the one that you're seeing, the wooden one, doesn't have any nails in it. And it's most famous for its thatched roof and also the stage. So you can see the stilts on the bottom of the picture. So uh, I don't know who started the trend, but apparently it was believed that if you jumped off the stage, it's, what is it, 13 meters. I've been in Japan too long to be able to do this conversion thing to feet. My apologies, but 13 meter drop to the bottom and if you survived, your wish would be granted. It had an 85.4% success rate. It um, did get banned pretty quickly, though. So the, the practice of jumping off the stage was banned in 1872. But there is a, state, a saying to jump off the stage, uh, kyo mizu dera, meaning that you know, you're pretty ballsy or taking quite the risk. Uh, so this is from the same temple, so it's like a complex, pretty much. So it sits on the top of a mountain, one of the many mountains in the city, sort of overlooks and protects the city in a sense. So you get a great view, great architecture, colorful architecture. You can see um, how even after the Nara period, you can see how a lot of the Chinese and Korean uh, architecture and traditions have continued to influence. Uh, temples and shrines throughout Japan. Now, as you can see, the city itself is actually quite urban. That surprises a lot of people since it has thousands of these like ancient temples and shrines, but it is a city. They do have a subway system and a bus system and everything else. Uh, however, especially these outskirts in the mountain, well, they're not really outskirts, but the, the mount by the mountains and the rivers and even spots throughout the city, you can find these beautiful little places. Moving on, another iconic image is the Golden Pavilion, which is great right now with no tourists, not gonna lie. It's usually one of the most crowded places because it's not that big. This is from 1397 um, by the Ashikaga Shogun. So they were sort of warlords for a shorter period of time. There, there had been some before them the Kamakura Shogunate, the Kamakura era, which ended when the Mongols tried to invade Japan and failed because of what's called the godly one or kamikaze. And also due to the help of lots of samurai who were loyal to the Kamakura Shogunate, uh, who lived in Kyushu, but the Shogunate didn't pay them and so Pretty much, they were not the shogunate for much longer after that. After that became the Ashikaga family. The beginning looked very promising. They actually moved their little de facto headquarters and capital to the real capital of Kyoto. The reason Kyoto, despite all these power changes in war, is considered to be the capital is because the imperial family consistently was living there. So that's why some other random places get to be the capital for short periods of time because the Actually, Hiroshima, believe it or not, was the capital for about a year during the Sino-Japanese War, the first one, <laughs> during the colonial period, the Meiji period. Uh, but Kyoto had the imperial family. They put up with all the people of Kyoto for 1,000 years. I applaud them. Um, but the Ashikaga, they had, this is called the Muromachi period. It's very known for both its extravagance and simplicity. The first part is very much the extravagance. I mean, look how much gold that is. Like who, I guess the excuse was gold is purifying and really great for your health or some other, no, not for health, but purify any negative thoughts. I mean, if I had that much money and I could build myself a golden gosh darn pavilion, yeah, I think I would feel my negative thoughts leave too, but probably because I had a lot of money and had a 
golden pavilion in my own private luxury garden. Um, anyways, like to go off on a tangent, the guy who made this one actually made so the first trade deal with China uh, because China at the time, they sort of had a system where to trade with China and anyone else in the sort of Chinese influential sphere in the 14th century, you had to pay sort of taxes and stuff to give China lots of gifts. And the Japanese imperial family was like, we bow to no one, we will give you no gifts. So China's like, okay, but we're not gonna trade with you, not just us, all these other countries aren't gonna trade with you either. And Japan doesn't really have a lot of resources, so uh, that was a bit of an issue, but the big loophole was Buddhist temples, actually. So there were some Buddhist temples that would allow China to choose their head abbot, like the head monk, in return for them having trade with China and all the other countries. So these temples became very rich, but Ashikaga made it a more formal trade deal. In fact, before he died, he was in the process of going sort of behind the emperor's back and trying to be called the king of Japan, the king, but he died before he could become the king. He chose the word king very smartly because uh, the imperial family are sort of untouchable and the fact that because they are the living deities and stuff, you can't like deny the imperial family for existing, but you can become the king or you can become a warlord. If he wanted to not just be a warlord, but a king, he even built a golden pavilion, but he passed away. And after his death, that's when it becomes a temple. That's when it becomes a Zen temple. And somehow it manages to survive the 200 year long warring states period that happened not too long after that, only to be burned down in 1950 by a 22 year old monk in an act of arson that shocked the nation. So that was crazy. It did get rebuilt in 1955 and the gold leaf got redone in 1987 and apparently it's even more gold than it has ever been before. The three floors are in three different styles. Uh, the first floor the one that's not gold, is supposed to be like the housing of the aristocrats of old Kyoto or Nara, you know, times that have probably been very romanticized by that point. The second floor is for the high-ranking samurai villa, and the top one is actually based on Chinese architecture very purposefully because the Ashikaga Shogun, he wanted to be known as the King of Japan by China. So he definitely had his reasons for that. Uh, there's a great book on the arson that was written only, it got published only one year after it got rebuilt. So the temple got burned down in 1950. This book came out in 1956 by Yukio Mishima, The Temple of the Golden Pavilion. It is uh, fictional, but it is based on the true events. It's a great read, highly recommend it. And the opposite side of the Golden Pavilion, we have the Silver Pavilion, which is much simpler. The probably unintentional start of a new movement of art in the opposite of visual excess, uh, wabi-sabi. So wabi-sabi is sort of the appreciation of things that are old or imperfect, uh, you know, not, not super flashy. This was by the grandson of the Ashikaga Shogun, another Ashikaga, uh, but this guy, he didn't really like the governing part of being the warlord, so a lot of people say he just sort of built his little retirement villa here and sipped on some tea, enjoyed the tea ceremony and looking at his garden as the entire country started to burn to the ground because of him not doing anything. Uh, there's a war called the Onin War, which was not that long in the 1400s, but that kicked off the 200 year long warring states period. So congratulations. Going on from there, we have uh, just this one last place I wanna focus on is Arashiyama. So this is in like the Northwest side of the city. It's very famous for the bamboo forest. This was the place where aristocrats would go to run away from people. So uh, historically, this had many of like the villas and vacation homes of many of the elite of old in the medieval period. 
And also in Hiroshima, there's lots of monkeys. So there's a, a mountain there that you can climb to the top and you can see the monkeys. Don't worry, it's not a zoo. The monkeys are completely wild. In fact, the humans are the ones that have to go in the cage if you want to feed them. Um, they're cute, but they're, they can also be a bit aggressive. And in Arashiyama, there's a very famous bridge called Togetsukyo, and that is the moon crossing bridge. It literally just means like the, the moon crossing bridge. And it's famous because an emperor commented on it once and then people started to try and decipher what the emperor said and figured it was a very romantic and wonderful place. It is very beautiful, especially if it's a clear night with a full moon. It does reflect very beautifully in the river. One last place is the place that's often overlooked in Arashiyama. It's called Gyoji. I mostly wanted to put this there because it connects with the Taira clan once again. The same guy who built that shrine in Hiroshima, Kiyomori. Uh, like I said, he was the height and downfall of his uh, clan pretty much. There's a famous war epic called Heike, the story of Heike pretty much. And in that you have this woman named Gyo, and she was sort of like, she wasn't a courtesan, she was a very famous dancer though. And she was Kiyomori's favorite, like she was number one. In fact, he treated her so well, he gave her family so many wonderful, luxurious things in life. But then the younger woman that she had trained to like allowed to dance as well, like she gave opportunity to became the new favorite and she kind of got exiled and banished. She actually turns out to be the lucky ones because she survived till the end of the story. So the whole thing about the Heike, the story of Heike is um, nothing lasts forever and being too arrogant uh, can really be your downfall. Although to be fair, it was written by the winners of the war. So the Taira clan got ousted by the Minamoto clan who became the Kamakura shogunate. And the Minamotos were at the height of the power when the story came out. So everything can be taken with a grain of salt. It's a lot of bad mouthing the Tyras. Um, so originally the story was in, just passed orally by blind monks that would go around and sort of sing the story. And then it got compiled more than a hundred years later. But this temple, Gyoji, this is where Gyo, where she ran out when she had to flee for her life pretty much because she was exiled. This is where she went to live out the rest of her days as a nun. And she lived here and her mother of also. And her grave is actually here. It's a beautiful moss garden. Moving on, I'm going to leave Kyoto now and go towards Tokyo in this beautiful place called Hakone. This is, you know, where you get the best views of Mount Fuji. And it's also one of the major stops on an ancient highway called the Tokaido. So the Tokaido connects present day Tokyo with Kyoto. Some people argue that it goes all the way into Osaka as well. But the main point of the highway was because the imperial family, they lived in Kyoto. They continued to live through Kyoto during the Warring States period and also when the Tokugawa Shogun took over for the like 200 years until 1868. So until from the 1600s to 1868, the Tokugawa's in order to not have all of the political power and everything in one place, they made a de facto capital, but they couldn't officially call it the capital because the emperor didn't live there in what's now Tokyo, but they didn't call it Tokyo because the Kyo is capital and it wasn't. So they called it Edo at the time. And what they would do is all of the war, other warlords, the lesser warlords and samurai and the daimyo who were kind of like the governors of their little fiefdoms, they all had to go to Edo and sort of like prove their loyalty once a year or so. And it was quite the journey. People had to go from all over the country. So all these highways got set up. The one from Kyoto to Tokyo is uh, the most famous and there are many stops on the way, Hakone being one of the most famous ones. Now, being Hakone, gotta talk about Mount Fuji. It's the tallest mountain in Japan. You can see it from an air, I forgot. I think if you're going towards Narita maybe, you can see it, but you'll definitely see it from the Shinkansen if it's not super cloudy as well, if you're going from Tokyo to Kyoto. 
No, it's Hokkaido. It, even though the original paths aren't all there, you can still walk it if you really want to. I know some people, they make it a point to bike it. Uh, now, Mount Fuji itself is 3,776 meters. That is 12,389 feet. It's not the tallest mountain in the world, but it is one of the tallest on the island, on an island. It's also an active volcano. The last eruption that took place between 1707 and 1708. The reason the year is sort of two years is because the eruption started in December and then ended in the next, the next year in 1708. It is definitely a cultural icon. So here I have two paintings. One is by the very famous Hokusai. You probably know Hokusai if I show this, this iconic waves crashing over Kanagawa. So he's very famous for his woodblock prints and it is said he had an absolute obsession with Mount Fuji because even in this picture with the waves, you have Mount Fuji in the background. Now, he didn't live in Hakone. Uh, he actually lived in Edo, like present day Tokyo. Uh, but he is said to have traveled a lot to Hakone, a lot. Uh, there was a huge domestic tourism boom in the late medieval period, as long as you weren't a woman because women weren't allowed to travel or some stupid crap like that. But we've got Hokusai and he got another painting. All right, sorry, woodblock print. And now the other painting I have is from a period a little later. So Hokusai is from, he's like most famous as a 19th century woodblock artist. Whereas the second artist, Yoshida Hiroshi, he is from the early 20th century. So you can see quite a few differences between the two. So Hokusai was living during the Tokugawa Shogun. The Shogun, it was super strict. There was no contact allowed really with the outside world except for the, the one designated place in Nagasaki, which was nowhere near Edo. Whereas for Yoshida, Yoshida, this was like when everything opened up again and the samurai got kicked out sort of and the imperial family went back into power. This was like the height of the colonial period. And during that time, a lot of artists, they began to study in France and Europe and they started to incorporate the movements that were going on simultaneously in Europe into Japanese art. So Yoshida is very famous for his combining of romanticism and impressionism into his pieces, but he still can, keeps lots of Japanese themes. So you can see how he uses a color and perspective very differently from Hokusai who takes more of a traditional approach. Also in Hakone, if you go there, um, if the weather is nice, that's great. If the weather is bad, you probably won't see Mount Fuji because Mount Fuji is very shy. Just a little bit of cloud cover and Mount Fuji just disappears. It's like a magic trick. It's so big, but it disappears. And I've got this beautiful lake. So you can take these little swan boats or pirate ships around the lake to get a good view. There's also a volcanic valley there that sometimes is closed because the, the, the noxious fumes, but sometimes it's open to the public. And thanks to all these active volcanoes, you get lots of these as well. These are called onsen tamago. So these are eggs that are like boiled in the natural hot springs. The ones on the, the mountain, really like all the gases, it's like sulfuric gas. And because of the combination of the gases and the mineral makeup of the that particular onsen, the eggs turn black. Now, depending on the type of onsen, most onsen eggs do not turn this color, but there they do. And they're very famous and supposedly add seven years to your life for each egg. I mean, I got to talk to the locals here, see if they're living forever just having these eggs every day. Now, the onsen, the hot springs, I highly recommend that people who have a chance go there. Now, some of them are monkeys only. Uh, like they won't let you share that onsen with the monkeys because they're highly territorial. <laughs> But they are cute to look at. There are some, there's some places where you can watch them enjoy themselves in the onsen. But most onsen are for humans like us. And there are many different types. And there are some that are outside called rotenburo. And those are ones where 
you can go inside and look at the beautiful scenery. And then there's lots that are indoors as well. Now, the thing about onsen is they're all naturally heated from the geothermal energy in the earth. There is another type of public bathhouse uh, called sento, which are heated by man-made means as well. Now, I can't talk about that without getting a bit into the bath. So bathing is very important. So most houses, even little apartments will have a bath. It's actually very hard to sell a place if you don't have a bath inside already. So four, or sorry, four, three pictures. So the first one is a metal tub that's round. That's, a, that's like the most old school one. And those ones would be heated underneath by fire or charcoal or what have you. Uh, that would scare me because I would worry I would boil alive in it, especially since one famous historical figure did get boiled alive in one of these bathtubs named Goemon. He was like the Japanese Robin Hood. Uh, the guy who built a Osaka castle originally, Hideyoshi Toritomi, he was not a fan of Goemon stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. And eventually he got caught and allegedly he was boiled alive. I mean, medieval period, what can I say? <laughs> they had very creative ways to execute people back then. And now uh, the middle bath, it's, um, I mean, it is post-war, it's a bit more old school, it's a wooden one. And then we got the plastic one. So for bathing in Japan, you don't actually wash yourself in the bath. The bath is sort of for recuperating and warming up. And you, you know, you take, you shower first, you wash off first. And once you clean, you get in. This is also true for the hot springs. You clean yourself first and then you go in. I'm gonna leave the beautiful town of Hakone now and go to Tokyo, the ever so crowded Tokyo, the most populous city. It's like a city prefecture. It's giant and condensed. Now the picture I have here is Shibuya Crossing. This is the very famous crossing where Oh, it's just so many people, so many people going about their day. Now, the reason Tokyo is the capital now is because after the Tokugawa samurai were ousted, you get the imperial family leaving Kyoto and going to Tokyo. Now, no one's like completely sure why they decided they were done with Kyoto. Um, there, I have heard some jokes that I, I will refrain from saying about Kyoto people as to why the emperor left. But pretty much the Meiji emperor went to Tokyo. And this is, they, they actually have their palace there. Surprises a lot of people that it's not like this grand palace, like, you know, European kings and queens looking castle. It's it maybe by uh, Western standards it might not look so grandiose but it, it does take up a lot of space and that is the ultimate flex especially in Tokyo like look how much of the city is theirs I have it on the map circled in red and except that obviously you can't go into their living quarters but most of their property is actually open to the public you can go to some museums you got the parks and the little forest in their gardens. So all of that is open to the public. Uh, there's also a moat that goes around it. Um, <laughs> don't skinny dip in the moat. Apparently an Australian tourist did that once and got deported. So don't be that guy. Be respectful when you visit other countries. Moving on. So another famous place in Tokyo. I know Tokyo is, you know, the big metropolis, the giant city, but it does have its own share of shrines and temples as well. So this is a Shinto shrine again, it's called Meiji Jingu. It's actually a very new shrine as far as shrines go, considering we were talking about ones that were from the 500s and 700s AD. This one is from the 1920s actually. And it was only built after the first emperor who lived in Tokyo, the Meiji emperor passed away. So this was to enshrine him and his wife, Empress Shok. And this shrine, the original shrine, was actually built with a lot of labor from the colonies and the whole country. So the colonies that really contributed to the shrine, you have 
what is you know current day North and South Korea. At the time, it was just Korea. Uh, we got Taiwan, Kwantung, and the current. It belonged to Japan at the time, but current day South Sakhalin, which is sort of the part right above Hokkaido, uh, that got Russia got that back sort of again after World War II. So there's lots of timber and raw materials from all these other parts of the world. However, uh, during the Tokyo air raids, it did get destroyed and the current shrine is from 1958. Now in not just this shrine, but many shrines, you'll see these calves. I have a picture of these uh, sake barrels. So sake being like Japanese rice wine or Nihonshu. And that's because this is sort of like an offering to the gods and Shintoism. I think I already sort of touched on the impure things like death and dying and blood and all that stuff. But there are also the pure things, the good things. So you often see these in all shrines, big and small, even little household ones. And those would be water. I mean, water gives birth to life. You need water to live. You have salt, another thing you need. You have rice, that's like the staple uh, crop of Japan. And everyone's favorite, sake, the drink of the gods. Everyone needs to imbibe sometimes. Now, also at the shrines, you will see these a lot. They're called emma. So emma, it literally just means like, picture of a horse or horse picture, but you can see there's no horses on them. Uh, these are actually just like wooden plaques that people write their wishes on. And then eventually they sort of get uh, burned. So like there's a lot of purification by fire as well as Shinto. So there's lots of fire festivals and sometimes they burn things down in the past, but they have lots of regulations in place now. So if you have a chance to see a fire festival, they're pretty awesome. Uh, but the reason they think that the origin of the word is from horse is because in the prehistorical Japan, they have on earth lots of these terracotta horse sculptures and people sometimes conjecture, there's like no, you know, 100% on this, but some people conjecture that uh, horses played an important role in sort of the prehistorical version of Shinto or like Japanese folk religion, but we're not completely sure. So this is for Tokyo Air Rage raids. So I have the before and after picture. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that uh, casualty wise and damage wise, it was actually greater than either the atomic bomb at Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So it's estimated more than 100,000 people perished in these or around 100,000 people. It's hard to tell because during the colonial, especially the wartime period where Japan sort of became a military space, there's a lot of slave labor that was sort of brought in from the colonies. So there's a lot of undocumented uh, people from Korea or China or like Southeast Asia. We don't, mostly Korea and China though. So we don't actually know the real numbers. This was true for Hiroshima and Nagasaki as well. There were a lot of conscripted, AKA like slave labor from the colonies. So we don't know the true numbers. Um, now, after World War II, there was the American occupation and a lot of money went into rebuilding the country, seeing as pretty much all the major cities had been like completely bombed out. And Tokyo made a great return. Now, I know that the Americans did have censorship, especially when it came to a lot of like uh, war atrocities and whatnot. But pretty much as soon as that censorship thing ended, you get like this kind of classical golden era of Japanese film and probably one of the most famous which takes place in post-war Tokyo like right after the war like right after the rebuilding is called Tokyo Story. Uh, highly recommend it. It is uh, it does focus a lot on the family relations but I think a lot of people do say this is one of the best films of all time. Uh, I know it's black and white but if you have a chance to see it somewhere I highly recommend this film as well by Ozu Yasujiro, another one of the great directors of Japan. Now also in Tokyo, you have Harajuku. A lot of people have probably heard of this, a lot of the youth fashion. On the left, you have the station. It's like this cute little, you know, post-war station. And you're like, oh, 
that's so cute. This area is so, you know, quirky and retro. And then you turn around on the weekend and you see this in front of you, like all the people and you're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get through this? But if you avoid national holidays and weekends, it's not as bad as the picture I put up there for shock value. And there's lots of side streets. So in like the 70s and 80s, this was sort of like the place for youth subculture, but then it became too popular. So now there's a lot of, you know, big name brands and international companies with their stores. But if you go off of the side streets, you go to the alleys and you do some exploring, you can still find a lot of the cool stuff. Uh, this is just probably one of the more famous styles to come out. There's the Lolita fashion, where it's like sort of a mix of kind of Victorian and modern and Japanese fashion all in one. And another very famous place is Akihabara. Uh, Osaka has its little mini Akihabara as well called Denden Town, but Akihabara is bigger and more famous and it's featured in a lot of anime. So like animes like Japanese cartoons. And originally it wasn't really like the anime center, it was like the computer parts center. So people who were just like really tech savvy, you know, all of your parts, black market or otherwise would be in Akihabara. And then in the 80s and 90s, you get this new thing called Nintendo and video games. Nintendo is actually a Kyoto company, by the way, it's in Kyoto, go Kyoto. Uh, but you get this video game boom, pretty much. And being the tech area already, you end up with lots of cafes and even more things. So uh, game arcades, and then uh, anime, the anime boom eventually comes and then you get all of the anime stuff like figurines and places that are themed off of it, uh, comic like comic books, manga. There's a lot going on in Akihabara. And for me, I think for those who are looking to watch something or read something that takes place there, that's really fun. Uh, there's a sci-fi, it started off as a visual novel actually, so visual novel it's like you can play it on a game console but like you're just like reading through it and sometimes you on visual novels you can like choose the direction the story goes sort of, uh, but then it got turned into an anime, but it's a very good anime so I think a lot of people who might not even like anime might enjoy Steins Gate. Um, so that takes place in Akihabara, you get like all of your stereotypical nerds are like all sorts of different nerds together and they time travel and mess things up pretty badly but I'm not gonna say anything else because that anything would be a spoiler and also you got the maid cafes I went to one once I don't know if I want to go again um but yeah you have the maid cafes where they talk to you all cutesy and serve you cute food as long as you keep paying the money to talk to you cutesy and serve you cute food the last place I want to talk about in Tokyo is Kabukicho. Now Kabuki, for those of you who don't know, is a traditional form of Japanese theater that Kabukicho does not have within it, <laughs> which I always found kind of funny. Apparently that's because uh, for before World War II, the Meiji Emperor made this area a duck sanctuary, like, like ducks, like the bird because <laughs> it was a swamp and I guess the perfect environment for them. But then it became an all-girls school and then the war happened and it got destroyed. And then afterward, there was like a proposition to make it a theater district. We're like, we're going to make a Kabuki theater. But then it never actually happened. And this area was actually one of the few areas where uh, foreigners were allowed to legally buy land at the time. So a lot of immigrants who had come from China actually bought a lot of land and were like, well, who cares if there's a theater, we're going to make bank off of this area. And then it somehow became like the cabaret district and then the red light district. And some people were saying that it was one of the biggest red light districts in Asia. I don't really know if that's true because then the government really cracked down on it, and, uh, that sort of stuff, although it still sort of is the red light district. There's a lot going on all at once in this area, but it's also very famous for its standing bars. Um, I've been to Kabukicho many times. I feel it's very safe. 
uh, you can go to these standing bars or these izakaya, which are like gastro pubs, and you can, it's a great place to have lots of small dishes. And then you usually just have a beer with the small dishes. It's a great way to sort of interact with the locals as well. Very famous street is called Golden Dive, which the landowners have been very obstinate because around this area, it's all skyscrapers and new, but the landowners here, they have pretty much kept it the same since like post-war Japan in like the 1950s and 60s. So it's like all these little tiny buildings and pubs that can only like fit five people. And it's just this cute little street. It's also only a 10 minute walk from Nichome, which is like the largest concentration of LGBT bars and clubs in the world, which is, I didn't realize that that was in Tokyo, but Tokyo does have the largest concentration of LGBT bars and clubs in the world in that one little area. Now, that concludes us going through all the places in Japan. Well, we didn't go to most of the places in Japan. This is more just like an introductory virtual tour, if you will. So I just wanna go through some of the food now. So everyone knows sushi. Tokyo is very famous for its sushi, actually. We can get a lot of good sushi that is relatively inexpensive, probably because of all of those miles and miles of coastline and ocean. And of course there are the fish markets. I know there's a famous one in Tokyo and they had, they got too popular. So they, they made like a, a tourist one and then the real one that they keep private. And every year the tuna, the maguro tuna, I think it's a bluefin tuna in English, uh, always gets this ridiculous bidding price at the beginning of the year, the very first fish. And apparently the first tuna of the year is always bought by the same guy who runs a sushi chain <laughs> called Sushi Zanmai. <laughs> and he buys it every year. He must have a lot of money because he's paying millions of dollars for a fish every year. Now, another thing that I think if you have a chance to try, you should, is the noodles in Japan. You have, I guess, like three main types. Uh, there's more than this, obviously, but the first one is udon. This is a wheat-based noodle. Um, you know, you can tell if it's good or not based on the noodle, because if they don't, if the flour doesn't have enough gluten in it or they don't need it enough, it's not, it just doesn't have the right consistency. But if you get that perfect bowl, you will know. It's usually in a simple broth. Now there are some changes depending like what part of Japan you're in, like how they want to make the broth, what flavors they prefer. But, you know, I just have a picture of the most simple one where it's just the broth and some onions. A lot of Japanese food is very simple and just about bringing out the flavor of the ingredients, like focusing on the quality uh, rather than all the different flavors. On the opposite side of that, you have ramen, which there's an infinite amount of ramen. Like if you can imagine it, it probably exists ramen. Uh, the main ones, you have the tonkotsu broth, the pork bone broth, you have the soy sauce based broth, chicken broth, the one that's called the salt broth. And then you get all sorts of crazy ones. You can even get like a soy milk one in some places. I saw an Italian fusion one once where it was like a tomato broth with garlic, but with ramen noodles and uh, the chashu, the pork. So people get creative with ramen. So I really recommend you try it. And the other one is soba. This is a buckwheat one. Apparently, historically, when people had much more trouble getting food, soba, the buckwheat, has some extra vitamins in it that help prevent people from being malnourished, which is a cool fact. I really like soba in the summer when it's served like in the picture where it's cold and then you dip it into the uh, sauce. And another thing is tea. I know some people, maybe they're iffy on green tea, but especially if you're in Kyoto, you gotta try the green tea. Kyoto is very famous for it. And there's lots of different types. Uh, you have the, I guess matcha is the one a lot of people know, that's the powder one, but it's not just like powdered green tea. It's like, a, a, it has to be a very specific type of tea leaf. So the way they make matcha is they grow the tea leaves in the shade actually. So when it becomes harvesting time, they grow it in the shade and that forces them to produce more tannins and it makes the leaves darker and it gives them a lot more umami, sort of like that, you know, that sixth flavor of umami. And they're dried flat. They're not like most tea leaves that are for, that you put the hot water on. They're like, in Japan, they're rolled um, like this. But the matcha tea leaves, they stay flat. 
and then it gets ground into a powder very slowly by a stone grinder. And it has to be done slowly because if it's too fast, that creates too much friction and heat and that burns the matcha and ruins the flavor. But you can see this in a lot of sweets and whatnot. You can get cheaper matcha, but you can also get like fancy matcha that goes for hundreds of dollars for just like a little bit. Uh, other tea you have essential. That's the tea that's grown in the sun and probably the most common green tea. And you can also have roasted green tea, which is great in the winter. For those who want a bit more flavor or, you know, don't really like green tea on its own, maybe the roasted tea, the hoji cha, or, or maybe another one called genmai cha. So that's a green tea mixed with toasted rice kernels. So that's a very good one as well. There's more tea than that, but I could talk about this for like three hours. So we're just going to move on to the next slide. Vending machines. A lot of people like vending machines. When I first moved here, I don't even want to admit how much money I spent on vending machines. It was a lot. Um, obviously, after seven years, it, they're just a normal thing for me now. But what I remember when I first came here, I was completely entranced. Like they have, like in the summer, it's all cold drinks, but come winter, they have the hot drink section. And it's not just drinks, you can get things like soup and stuff, like miso soup or corn soup. And most recently, last year, and I think they're going to have it again, was they had a lobster biscuit in a can. And I know that might sound horrifying for some people, but it was actually really good. I liked it um, quite a lot. And I know these vending machine companies, they're really smart. Like they know what they're doing. There's almost 3 million in the country. That's like one per 40 people. <laughs> There's a lot. Even if you go to the middle of nowhere, you will find vending machines. Like just, there's there's no signs of civilization, but there is a vending machine. And apparently the reason the vending machines are so prolific is that the companies is like, they will, they give you the machine, they help lease it out to you relatively inexpensively. So anyone, if you have like a land, you have a place to put it, you can have your own vending machine. So apparently a lot of people do this as a side gig because they get to keep a pretty good percentage of the money and the vending machine companies, like you can see in the uh, one picture, there's the, the Coca-Cola truck that comes and helps restock and everything. Now in the summer, especially, there's lots of festivals. So if you get your timing right, you can participate in some or watch some. I know in Hokkaido, they have their snow festival, which is like in the winter. So. So they have all the ice sculptures and stuff. Speaking of that, I uh, just want to end the Four Seasons. When should you visit? Well, kind of depends where you're going because uh, if you go far enough south like Okinawa and then further south to like the little islands there, it's like tropical islands. So then in those places, it's just like, okay, avoid the, the typhoon season and then you're, you're good. Uh, but Trolls is a fall. Uh, so this picture is like the momiji, the maple tree leaves. Now, a lot of people want to see them, but a lot of people sort of underestimate how late they change color. Obviously, this depends because like I said, Japan pretty much spans the north and south equivalent of the east coast of the United States from like Maine to Florida. So there is definitely variation in this. Uh, in Kyoto and Tokyo, I would say like right now things are starting to turn. However, other species of trees, uh, they change color before the maple tree. So if you like the bright yellow of the ginkgo tree, that's like we're in the middle of that right now where I am. However, I'm sure if you go further north, they're already pretty much done with the fall. And if you go further south, they're probably just like a week or so behind. Uh, fall's great. The weather is not so bad. You know, it's not too hot. It's not too cold. To me, this is my favorite time. And because it's less uh, famous than the cherry blossom season, and there's less like national holidays around this time, usually it's like a little less people. You now winter, so where I am doesn't get this much snow. However, th there are the Japanese Alps. Like I said, there's lots of mountains and there's a range that's known as the Japanese Alps that is very famous for its skiing and due to ocean currents and whatnot and the humidity uh, there are some places in Japan that just get massive amounts of snow like ridiculous amounts of snow and 
I just want to give a shout out to any Australians watching this because you are the unofficial colonizers of the Japanese Alps every winter when all of you come here on your your what is it your working holiday visas and work in all the resorts and all the Australians come for the, the skiing. And now spring, so spring is very famous for the cherry blossoms, but if you're early spring, so more, you know, end of February, like March, uh, beginning of March, I'm going from my area, you know, the Tokyo and Kyoto area, climate wise, you can also see the plum blossoms, which I like better personally. They're not as flashy as the cherry blossoms, like in this picture, but they do smell heavenly. I love it. Uh, they smell great and there's these little birds, I don't know what they're called in English, but they're called uguis and they're like little green birds and they, they eat the nectar and they're so cute and they have like the most adorable little call. And finally summer, so <laughs> unless you're there specifically, like early summer is fine, so if it's May it's not, not bad. And if you're going pretty far north then you can get away with you know June and July maybe, but for most, unless you're going to like the, the far south where the tropical islands are or very far north where it doesn't get so hellish in the summer, I don't recommend coming to Japan July and August. It's really hot. It's really humid. Unless there's something that you specifically wanted to do during that time, like there's a festival you wanted to go to, like for example, uh, Osaka and Kyoto have two of the biggest festivals in Japan. One is called Tenjin Festival and one is called Gyo Festival. And uh, both of those are in July, pretty much. Uh, however, other than that, I think the other three seasons are better, but I'm a bit biased. All right, so thank you all for taking the time to listen to me. I put some random Japanese phrases if you wanted to give it a go. And if you have any questions. Great, thank you, Marty. Thank you so very much. Um, as you all know, it's probably very easy for Marty to conduct a tour in person when she's walking us around. And you can tell she's a great storyteller. She has great stories about every location that we visited. But um, to actually put it together on a virtual slide presentation is a whole different story. I'm sure it took her a lot of time, energy, and research, and um, a knowledge of technology that she probably never wanted. <laughs> Um, so um, while we get into the uh, Q&A session, I'm just going to ask Marty to um, take a look at the questions as we go through. And um, please know, everybody, I, I have dropped in the question in the um, comments section, the, the chat section, ways um, to tip Marty. And then also I'll be sending out a follow up email tomorrow. Um, and that will include a link to the recording. I know a lot of people have asked about the recording. This is being recorded. Um, so you will be able to watch it if you've missed anything and you will be able to share it with your friends um, that weren't able to join us. So Marty, I'm gonna go to you if you're okay with that now and sort of go through these questions. I always call this the rapid fire Q and A session because there are so many questions and you do have to kind of address them in a speedy fashion to get through all of them. But if you're ready, we can go into them and um, I'll, I'll give the microphone back over to you. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll try to go through these. Um, I am not all knowing though, so I'm sure there'll be a few I don't know the answers to. Uh, let's see, let's start from Javanka DJ. Any insights for its Olympic 2021 Tokyo? Oh gosh, like drama never ends. <laughs> so uh, for those who didn't know, Japan was supposed to host the 2020 Olympics that the government was so gung-ho on holding until they just could not hold it anymore. So they got canceled. Um, now the government is pretty gung-ho on having it in 2021, mostly uh, for political and economic interest. A lot of money was involved, so it's in Japan's best interest to host it. However, I don't think we're going to know until like a month or two before, so <laughs> sort of like the 2020 Olympics. They're going to keep holding out hope until then. Yeah. 
Dan Richard is supposed to go to Japan in 2 May 2020. I'm so sorry that it was canceled. I'm sorry too. May was wonderful in terms of the weather and everything else. And even though I'm a tour guide, it was actually kind of nice not having as many tourists around. So less crowded too. Uh, what's the population? It's about one third of the US. It's uh, about 126 million people. How did, oh, can you talk about Sakhalin? Uh, David Souls, I'm so sorry. I need to do more research into Northern Japan. I mostly specialize in the Western region. Uh, so talking more like Kyoto and Nara Osaka. However, it's a place I'm very interested. I would like to learn more about it. Paula Mira, how did you become interested in Japan? That's a great question. Um, I did know some exchange students when I was in high school, but I don't really think I got super interested until university. Uh, just something I just wanted to try living very far away from home, uh, but also the food is great. And I guess I've always been the type to like a challenge because I think one of my goals from university was to become bilingual. I could have chosen like any language. I could have chosen Spanish or Italian, but <laughs> I don't know why I chose Japanese. Uh, <laughs> definitely very difficult for someone who only knows English. Oh, uh, Tiger. Oh, sorry. My uh, Janine P. Uh, I meant to say Taiga, not Tiger, the animal. Taiga, it's like a subarctic climate. So it just means it's really, really cold. Uh, when was the Osaka Castle last with Catherine Galagos? Yeah, I'm sorry if I botched your name. So um, that's a good question. Technically, it's 1995. However, there have been new additions like Wi Fi and a I mean, I'm all for making it barrier free, but the way they made it barrier free is they added like a big glass elevator that's very modern on the outside, but hey, that adds to the charm. Uh, suicide, a common thing that happens now in Japan since it was such a big thing in the Japanese history from Janine P as well. Uh, so historically, the first sort of like honor suicide uh, took place sort of when that Tyra family was like uh, vying for power. They had a huge battle in uh, Uji, which is just south of Kyoto, and one of the Minamoto guys, like sort of like the rivals, uh, they lost the battle. And in order for the Tyras not to get his head, he committed suicide, and his sort of trusty underling took his head for safekeeping. Because in the medieval period during the wars, if your enemy got your head, that was the greatest dishonor. Uh, so I think, you know, having it be for honor and also even before the whole samurai debacle, debacle if I can speak English, uh, oftentimes uh, disputes for who would inherit the family throne were solved with consensual suicide. I don't know how consensual it really is because if your choice of suicide or being killed, I guess that was seen as the better way to go. However, in modern Japan, after World War II, there were a few like kind of public suicides like on national TV, which was, but I don't think that's the norm. I think some people did that. And then when the economy crashed after there was like a bubble period in the eighties and when that crashed again, there was a bit of a spike. However, uh, now looking at the numbers, uh, it's actually about the same as the United States in terms of suicides per 100,000. Uh, Paula Nifflmoon, I'm so sorry. I'm so bad with names. Oh, uh, what tough cities would you suggest to visit and for how many days each if you only have two weeks to be in Japan? Uh, bus or train? Uh, definitely train if that's an option. Uh, if it's your first time, I would say, you know, Kyoto, Tokyo, kind of like where we went for this tour today because they're all uh, very well connected on the Shinkansen. And then if you're going for a second time, then you can sort of maybe focus on some of the smaller cities or more out there areas for a longer period. Uh, what sports does Japan have or what are the most common? The most popular is baseball. So even when Japan had a sort of slow burn military coup that took it from just being your regular colonial power to uh, the, the military government that brought it into World War II and they banned anything they deemed to Western, baseball was so popular. Like they couldn't ban it. They just gave it a Japanese name, Yaku. So, Baseball is number one, um, other major ones, soccer, and now rugby. Actually, they did pretty well, better than anyone thought in 
the finals this last year and they even hosted it the final tournaments in Japan so rugby is getting up there how are vegan options in Japan by Yvonne Werner so uh, sadly this is a little difficult if you are vegan or gluten-free or have um, any sort of like major allergy I would recommend planning ahead and looking up the restaurants ahead of time because uh, a lot of places still don't completely understand it but if you go to the major cities like Osaka or Tokyo or Osaka, uh, Kyoto, you can find a few, but the options are very limited in my opinion. Uh, Daniel Bourgeois, is there a lot of smoking in Japan? Yes. <laughs> it's getting better though compared to when I moved here. It used to be all restaurants were smoking, but it's changing. It's changing, finally. Um, anonymous user, how much is meant for a one bedroom apartment or studio? This depends on the city. Uh, obviously, if you're in like the center of Tokyo, you can find places that are a few thousand US dollars a month. Uh, however, you might be very happy to know that rent in Japan is a lot cheaper than the US. Uh, you can find a lot of places between 500 and 800 dollars a month and even cheaper if you are willing to go for very small or very old. Uh, what does Shima? Does Shima? Shima means island gala. So uh, let's see. Susano and Amaterasu. So those are two of the main Shinto gods, their brother and sister. So Amaterasu is the sun goddess and Susanoo is the thunder god and they had lots of sibling fights. Uh, Prava Srinhar, are these Shinto goddesses still worship? In a sense, yes. Now, religion in Japan, uh, Buddhism and Shinto are the two major ones. However, when they try and do a questionnaire and ask what's your religion, it always ends up being more than 100% because uh, I think uh, religion is taken a bit more casually by uh, a good portion of the population here and it's seen as part of the culture more so than as you know like a, a stringent religion. Eric Robin, how long would this virtual tour be in person if we went to Japan? Oh my gosh to actually go to all the places and enjoy them it would at least be like a week or two I think. Um, are your Rhonda McKinney are you two confined to the main island? Uh, for me personally yes um, Although if somebody was willing to finance me taking the bullet train to some of the other islands like Kyushu or Shikoku, I'm sure anything is possible. Uh, Marie Jose Carroll, is the book Barefoot Again suitable for a 12 year old child obsessed with everything Japan? Um, if you're okay with your 12 year old reading things about the Holocaust, like not, there's no, it is drawn, like it is, it's not like real pictures or anything. Uh, maybe you can flip through it a bit yourself and decide if you think that's okay. I think it's okay, but I think it also depends on a person by person basis. Um, Clem Moore, how many cranes did she finish? I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact number, but I'm sure if I Google it, I can find it. Uh, Carmel Krauss, who or how was Buddhism introduced to Japan? So. Buddhism came to Japan through the Silk Road pretty much. A lot of people actually say it wasn't Nara or Kyoto, but actually Osaka and maybe maybe Kyushu where uh, it first really made it strong foot. But Osaka has the oldest temple actually in Japan, um, at least oldest in terms of what written records say. Uh, Heidi Netherton, why did the excellent tour guide choose to live in Japan? You're one of her parents Japanese. No, but my parents, they both live in Texas of all places. Uh, <laughs> no, my, my family is uh, not Japanese. Um, I did have a cousin who lived in Japan um, for a while. But no, let's see, Nancy Brennerman, why do Shinto shrines use the color orange? That's a good question because the older Shinto shrines don't use that color at all. The older ones are more of the natural color, like a natural wood um, or natural, you know, mud or plaster. But uh, after, because of the influence from the Silk Road, uh, lots of like new things came in and older temples are very colorful. But then something happened and it flipped and the Shinto shrines began to sort of like use all of the red. Uh, there's lots of things for the red. Uh, I think the main one is that the vermilion, it's like a really good lucky color. It's the color of health and vitality. So, you know, the color of blood, blood means life. And that's a good thing. You wanna be alive. You don't wanna be blue because that means you're dead. And the other thing would be red is also the color, that reddish orange color is the color of the sun in Japan, which is like a 
sort of a shout out to the sun goddess as well. Uh, Maria Pastores, I noticed there are several temples built in the water. Is there a reason for that? Uh, yes, actually. So like the one I showed today, the Itsukushima Shrine, uh, that's because the island itself is also sort of seen as, as a deity. So you don't want to <laughs> upset the deity too much. So you build that on the water, but also the water is pure. And also the body of water could also be a deity as well. So there's many reasons. Anonymous, is that picture of the silver pavilion a painting? No, it is actually a picture. It's really beautiful. Uh, Lachlan Wadsworth, what is the lifestyle like in Japan? This is uh, individual by individual. I think it depends if you live in the city, uh, a suburb or the middle of nowhere. I mean, I grow vegetables, but I don't think I would be doing that if I lived in the middle of Osaka or Tokyo. Let's see, Flory Kaufman, what is the story of the golden figurines? Uh, the one on the in the golden pavilion, the one on the top is a phoenix. I think that's the only figurine and that's sort of representing rebirth. Anonymous. On the slides, is it hiragana or katakana? It's a combination of three. So that refers to the writing systems in Japanese, which um, is a little fakakta. So there's three, not counting uh, Roman letters and numeral and Arabic numerals. Oh my gosh, I cannot speak today. So the three main ones are the kanji, which are the Chinese characters. And then you have two phonetic alphabets. The curvy one is hiragana and the, the more angular one is katakana. There's no spaces in written Japanese. So using the three, they serve their purposes and help kind of break up the text. Uh, Roberta Peel, can you ever go into the palaces? So if you're referring to the castles, yes. Um, Although I only suggest going into the original, like the ones that are either close to original um, or older, because after World War II, anything that got rebuilt after that had to follow the new building code. So then they all ended up looking the same. Uh, Ellen Tress, could you talk about the culture of the geisha? Yeah, that's something I didn't get a chance to really talk about in this presentation due to time. Uh, but the geisha, they came about mostly in the medieval period, specifically the late medieval period, Edo period. So we're talking like the Tokugawa Shogun guy again from the 1600s to 1800s. They still exist today, actually. Uh, they are not prostitutes. Uh, they're not courtesans. They are artists. I know there's the Memoirs of a Geisha as well. Um, that was not written by a Geisha. <laughs> but you, uh, I think like the Geisha nowadays, it, they're kind of considered like living national treasures because they keep all these medieval arts alive. Um, and they're very exclusive. I'm not special enough to <laughs> to spend time with the geisha one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> Let's see, Cheryl Ram, do all Japanese ascribe to Shintoism? I wouldn't say all, uh, I know during the military state period, World War II, everyone was kind of had no choice, uh, but to just ascribe to what the military wanted Shintoism to look like. But after World War II, you get freedom of religion that is codified into law. So there's all sorts of religions there, there's all sorts, there's even people who are Christian, who are Jewish, who are Muslim, um, but obviously different sects of Buddhism, um, I would say are the most prominent, but they're not exclusive. So people can be Buddhist and also Shinto. Alfredo Martinez Cole, for people that want to experience country, Japan, older villages, where would you recommend they go visit? I think it sort of depends if you have a car or not, but, um, uh, I think that I like, it's not super real, but I like Kamakura. It's just, it's like the, it was the de facto capital in the uh, 13th and 14th century Japan. And it also managed to not get completely bombed out. And it's just, it's pretty convenient to Tokyo. There's also lots of places in Kyushu, I think, where you can experience the onsen and some rustic scenery as well. Uh, Christine Jubert, I'd love to hear about your favorite Japanese food or regional specialties to look out for. Oh gosh, there's so much. Every region has its specialty. If you are into having something different everywhere, I would just research before like the regions you go to and what they're famous for. Japan is a country obsessed with food. Let's see. Anonymous, do you have any must-see shows like musicals or cultural shows in Japan? And also, how do we get to watch a sumo wrestling? Uh, sumo wrestling is, it can be difficult because it's only for a limited time every year that you can actually see them, either practice or the actual wrestling itself. Um, depending on where you are, Tokyo and Osaka are the two major places for it. 
uh, just look ahead of time when you're traveling and see if it lines up with the sumo season. Uh, in terms of musical and shows, oh, there's a lot. So of course there's the traditional theater, there's the kabuki, uh, there's the bunako, that's a puppet theater. Um, there's also no, which is where they wear the mask, but there's also uh, sort of that colonial, started sort of in the colonial area where you have these uh, performing troops. I think the most famous is Takarazuko. You have these all-female performing troops that are very famous as well. If you're looking for something that's more like Broadway-esque flair. Uh, Lori G, I know that there is a lot of fish and seafood in Japan. What are other options and how careful are they regarding a severe fish uh, seafood allergy? Okay, so um, for a severe allergy, I would definitely do a lot of planning ahead of time because even if something looks like it's vegetarian or it is something that is a meat dish with no like obvious fish in it, often one of the major components of Japanese cooking is what's called dashi, which is a soup stock made from fish. So that is something that would require a lot of planning ahead of time. Uh, what is the gluten, Molly Finkelstein, what is the gluten-free noodle dish in Japan? I'm sorry, the soba noodles aren't gluten-free, so I, I would just assume most noodle dishes here are not, sadly, but rice is gluten-free, but I would bring your own uh, gluten-free soy sauce, since most of the soy sauce here is not gluten-free. Um, no, no, how are things in Fukushima now? They are definitely trying to rebuild, for sure. I think every year it gets a little better, but there's still, there's still things that need to be worked on. Uh, anonymous, where can we find some of these cool vending machines with lost for best and such in the US? I know, right? The US should just get the Japanese vending machines, but sadly not. Anonymous, when is the typhoon season? Uh, this varies a little bit. So if you go to like the more tropical islands by Okinawa, it's a little longer. Uh, and with global warming, it's also getting a little longer. But for the most part, like August and September-ish. But unlike earthquakes, you get plenty of warning. Uh, for a typhoon. Let's see, Leslie McDougall. Is there a reason or purpose for the upturned roofs in the architecture? You're talking about like the tile going like this. Um, I think it's mostly an aesthetic thing and often on the corners there's like the Japanese version of gargoyles called onigawara or demon tiles which are also like the same purpose to protect the building from fires and bad things. Uh, Camp Stranger, do people ever stay in ryokans? Well, ryokans are made for people to stay in them. That is a Japanese style hotel. So if you want to sleep on a futon, like the mattress on the floor, and you want to get like the full treatment with a fancy multi-course dinner and stuff, and usually they have an onsen as well. Definitely onsen, ryokan. Definitely should give it a shot. Uh, anonymous. Can you tell us any tricks to properly pronounce Japanese words? Uh, the vowels are the same as Spanish, so it's just a i u e o. Um, it is uh, tonal in a sense, but I wouldn't worry about it because it's not like Chinese where like that's something you need to absolutely get right. There's a YouTuber called Dogen who's also a Japanese learner. He talks a lot about the pitch tone accent, so you can check him out. Uh, Yulia Kamalan needs. Gaia, I'm so sorry if I mispronounce your name. Marty, what is your favorite anime? Oh gosh, there's quite a few. I really like the, the movies uh, by Satoshi Khan, a director taken from this world too soon. He made ones like Tokyo Godfather and Millennium Actress. Um, yeah, and I also really like Steins Gate as well. Andrea P, can you talk a little about tackling culture shock in Japan? It seems to me that she has a lot of very specific etiquette and rules for behavior, behavior depending on type of menu and the region you visit. What are the main cultural differences to take note of for first time travels? Well, the good news is if you don't speak Japanese or you don't speak it that well, if you, you kind of are exempt from a lot. Uh, I would say on the train, don't like talk on your phone, on speakerphone, people will give you like the death glare. <laughs> uh, people really hate that. Um, Tokyo has the stereotype of being very cold. So on the train in Tokyo and like the East in general, for some reason, nobody talks. I'm like, why you're with your friends? Why don't you talk? But if you go come to, come to the West side, we're, we're more chill here on the train. If you're with your friends, you can talk with your friends. But um, for restaurants and stuff, I mean, a lot of it's just common sense. Like don't be mean to people. Um, 
tipping, like I know the tour industry is a little different, but for most places you don't tip, like they get really mad at you if you try and tip like a taxi driver. Um, what else? Oh yeah, if you go into a house, like you take your, shirt, your shoes off and also bathrooms have like their own slippers. So if there's slippers in the bathroom, don't wear the slippers outside of the bathroom because those are like the bathroom slippers and you don't want to do that. But if you're not sure whether or not you have to take your shoes off, because sometimes it's hard to tell, you can just ask. Uh, people are happy to help. Uh, Dan Bolovsky, do people speak English in the country? <laughs> it depends where you are. Um, a lot of people like to try and practice their English. And if you're lost and looking for directions, even if there's a language barrier, uh, people here are so nice, like, and they'll help you get to where you need. Uh, let's see, Celine Toth, where do you recommend is the best place to see the cherry blossom trees in the spring? Anywhere that's not too famous and not too crowded. And every city, every town, every rural place has the cherry blossom spot. So there's nowhere you can definitely find it. Uh, anonymous, is any of the Hello Kitty attractions on the actual tour of Japan? Um, I'm not the one who designed the tour for uh, girl travel tours, the one that's in 2023. So I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, I know there's like cafes and stuff. Uh, Sorry that I can't answer that. Uh, Jeanette Frank, how much time should you plan to visit the locations you covered in Honshu? I'm a person who doesn't like to rush. So, you know, I would say like two weeks, but I, I know people who have just like rushed through it in a week. Um, but yeah, I like to take my time. Uh, Sarah F, how do you think that Japanese women try to behave and dress up as cute while the same behaviors are considered as very immature and ri ridiculous for women in the west um i'm not completely sure uh, what this like what you mean by behaving or dressing up as cute i know like the style is different and the colors are different and like people's mannerisms are different like the hand mannerisms and stuff but i think the cutesy stuff you might see like in a reality, like a news program, not news program, or like a talk show setting or like anime setting are highly exaggerated. Most people don't act like that. <laughs> uh, Manuela Goins, thank you so much. Absolutely delighted. Oh, thank you. I'm happy you enjoyed it. Uh, question, is it true that traditionally ladies cover their skin because dark skin is not quite acceptable? Uh, I think not acceptable is pretty strong, but um, there's definitely a bias towards like lighter skin because uh, mostly because of the great divide between peasants and the elite historically where working in the field would make you tan. Whereas if you, you know, if you were part of the elite then you could just stay inside all day. Um, yeah, but there's definitely some colorism for sure. Uh, Peter Volkel, is it common to downplay Tokyo tourism? I was going to Tokyo for business and asked some Japanese what I should see in my free time and they all say go to Kyoto. I found what I did really fascinating though. I found the building address system confusing. Oh my gosh. Yeah, addresses don't make any sense here. Like you, you get to the area and then you get to like the jet, like the block, I guess, or like whatever, however it's divided on the map. But the numbers mean nothing. They, It's not like the American address system where like the numbers go in numerology like they, they go in order, the numbers don't mean anything. So just Google map where you need to go. Um, yeah, but Tokyo is pretty big. I think it does have its places for sure. Uh, let's see, Susan Crane is Akihabara very crowded. Yes, <laughs> anonymous. What is the best matcha tea snack candy cookie that's also available for purchase in the US? I don't know what's available in the US, uh, but if you come to Japan, there's so much, maybe you can just, put it all in your suitcase and bring it back home. Sharon Rizzo, what are some great gifts to bring home? Oh, definitely like the snacks and cookies. Um, some people like the chopsticks and the fans or whatnot, but I'm more of a food person. <laughs> so I think I just fill my suitcase with food. Jeanette Frank, is it easy to navigate if you're English speaking only? I think as long as you're not going to like the middle of nowhere, it's pretty easy because over the years, especially like in the lead up to the Olympics that never happened, a lot of places that didn't have English signage before on the trains and stuff uh, now have English and Chinese and Korean. So they're definitely, especially with the English, they're definitely like going through 
even where I live where no tourists ever come like now has English everywhere for signs. Um, what nani means? Nani means what? <laughs> it, it, that's what it means, it means what? Um, Trevor Dowsett, coming from Austria, Australia, when is the fall see when does the fall season start and finish? So I know everything's the opposite. So uh, fall in Japan, uh, depending where you are, so like the far north, you know, that's like September or so, but I would say it's mostly like um, end of October and through November. Gray Ferguson, how did you learn so much about Japanese history? Uh, I just like history. <laughs> uh, I also majored in, in university and I'm also a tour guide, so I'm always learning. There's always something new to learn. Uh, Hi, I am from Nepal. I work as a material, material engineer in a local engineering consultancy. I want to know what and how did the Japanese deal with the earthquakes that happened so frequently there? I remember one year when I was seeing a breaking news on CNN for an above eight or nine scale earthquake eight or nine years ago. The next day, a local newspaper here in Nepal didn't even cover it. While we had a 7.8 scale earthquake in 2015, the whole world had covered it. Was it just because the large casualties we had or Japan has the secret technology to deal with it? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with building regulations. So in the 1990s, there was a very devastating earthquake in Kobe, which is in the prefecture neighboring Osaka. It's like right next to Osaka, pretty much another major city. And that had a pretty large casualty and like both like human casualty and then like lots of buildings were destroyed and which is absolutely devastating for the country. So since then they've upped the regulation for buildings for earthquakes. So I think that has helped. However, every once in a while you get um, an earthquake, maybe somewhere that uh, still has more of the traditional buildings that never got updated. And sometimes that can be pretty bad. Uh, let's see, Anonymous, do you think it's better to go on a guided tour through Japan or just go solo on our own? Um, once we can travel, of course, I think it depends what you're looking to get. Uh, you don't have to necessarily have a guy <clears throat> be with you from point A all the way to like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, like all for the whole thing. You can always find local guides in each location. Maybe you want to do some things on your own. Uh, maybe you just want to do a food tour or maybe you just want to have someone bring you to like different temples or whatnot. So I think it depends on what you're looking for specifically. Uh, Eki Heath, you mentioned the tropical heat and humidity in the summer. Is there air conditioning in most public places? Uh, yes and no. Uh, most places will have air conditioning inside, but mostly you will be outside touring. <laughs> so that's why it's really difficult. Anonymous, have you ever watched any of the big three anime, Naruto, Bleach, or One Piece? I have seen Naruto. I've seen like, I, I used to watch Naruto a lot in high school, not gonna lie. Um, and I did see a little bit of One Piece at one point. Uh, Paul Arredondo, what is the cheapest time of the year to travel to Japan? I think it depends what country you're coming from and what world events are happening. They vary. Melissa McNeil Ashcraft, have you been to a tea ceremony? I've always wanted to attend one. What's your favorite part about the teas there? Uh, tea ceremony? There's actually a few different schools of tea ceremony. I have been to uh, two or so, like official-ish ones. Um, I think it's a good experience to have once. But if you just want to drink the tea, I suggest Uji in Kyoto. Um, I'm just obsessed with tea. There's like, there's like a whole huge amount of it. Uh, you have the green teas, like in the green teas, you have like the more uh, bitter and astringent sencha, which is the tea grown in the full sun. And then you have what's called gyokuro, which is the tea grown in the shin, but not the one that becomes matcha, like the tea that gets rolled afterwards. And that one has a lot more umami and you brew it at a much lower temperature. And it tastes totally different. It doesn't even taste like tea for that first brew. And then you have the roasted teas, gabhojicha. And for those who are sensitive to caffeine, there's one called kyobancha, which is a Kyoto roasted tea that's roasted at an even higher temperature. And it's really good. So I'm just, I just go off on tea. Um, Grace Mink Entire. This is kind of random, but what animes do you know? I like the helpful Fox and Kosan, MHA, anymore. I'll visit Japan someday too. Uh, I used to watch a lot more when I was younger, so I'm very out of date. I did like, I do remember Psychopaths though. That was something I really enjoyed. And there's another one, Miss Hokusai, which was a manga first, which is about Hokusai's daughter that I really liked. Uh, Samantha Tang, how much does Takoyaki cost? Sounds so good. Uh, 
avoid the most touristy street and you will save a lot of money. I have the cheapest I ever found was 150 yen. Uh, but I have also seen it for like 800 yen, but usually it should only be about like 300, 400 yen. Anonymous, is there a museum for pianos or a tour of making pianos? I'm sure it exists somewhere in Japan. There's a museum for everything. Sarah Kurdenov, have you ever been to Iwakuni or Kintai Bridge? Not yet, it's on my list of places I need to go. Uh, Helen Cook, is it possible or easy to take a bicycle on a train between cities or in the more rural areas? Sadly, they have weird bicycle regulations. You have to like deconstruct your bicycle and put it in a certified bag to bring it on the train. It's not worth it. Uh, rent a bicycle at the location or rent a car. Gray Ferguson, what is a good English book about Japanese history? Oh, I'm sure if I look it up, I can remember some of the books I read in university. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I can't answer your question. Uh, Nicole Martin, can you recommend a book that I can learn how to speak Japanese? Uh, if you're a beginner level, there's two. There's uh, the Genki series, like G-E-N-K-I and Nakama, uh, that both cover sort of the beginner stuff. And uh, once you get the basics of the grammar down, then you can challenge yourself more anonymous. What are the streets and sidewalks of Tokyo like during COVID? So it's crowded and much less people. At the beginning, a lot less people. Now people seem to have forgotten about COVID and the rates are going up. Uh, Karen Mika, do you have family that moved with you? Did you meet people easily there? I live here with my partner and I came here uh, my senior year, for those who are not American, my last year of university. And that made it easy to meet people. And then through work, you meet people. So for me, it hasn't been a huge issue. Oh, let's see, anonymous. How easy is it to do a tour of the Suntory Distillery in Osaka? Um, I don't know right now because Corona has made everything really weird, but I think you just have to go through Suntory. I think they have an English site somewhere, but I know they do them. I know they do tours. Celine Top, where would you recommend a first time visitor to go stay for the most diverse experience? Temples, culture, architecture, food. Uh, maybe just come to Western Japan. There's so much here, you got the city and the rural and everything else. But if you're only in Tokyo, then I say like Tokyo and then just keep going south to like Kamakura and stuff. Um, John Watt, where are the art museums that might feature the 20th century woodblock artists, Kawase Hasui or the modern artist Yayoi Kusama? I know uh, Yayoi Kusama, uh, her work kind of travels around the country, uh, but I know she has like her permanent installment, like the, the, um, the pumpkin is on the art islands. There's an inland sea called Setonaikai, which is literally inland sea. A lot of people go there, but uh, Tokyo, Osaka, and then a random place in the middle of nowhere in Tokotori Prefecture uh, has a museum called the Dachi Art Museum that usually has a lot of the very famous artists. Uh, Gray Ferguson, any suggestions for Yokohama? So Yokohama is another city. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to talk about it today because it's often lumped in with Tokyo, but that was like one of the first poor cities to really open up to the outside world after the Tokugawa show get it. And it's, you know, it's got a lot of different cultures. Um, it's, it's a nice city. And they also have a, like a ramen town, like a little ramen place. So you can try lots of ramen. I like ramen. Uh, Gilly Gutierrez, would you recommend Nico? I've heard lots of great things about it. Uh, sadly, it's just a little far from where I live, but I'm planning on going now soonish while well, I don't have too much work. Uh, Chantal de Souza, hi Marty, this, that was a brilliant presentation. Thank you, wow, I feel so flattered. I've always found the culture of Japan so unique. May I know how long it took uh, for you to pick up the language and also how long to get comfortable settling in. P.S. How strong and visible is the devotion and fandom of anime in Japan? Thank you. Um, to answer your last question first, you'll be disappointed. It's not like super visible, the fandom, unless, unless you uh, find Sort of those little enclaves of people who are really into it but uh, a lot of people watch it i think in their free time it's just not it, it, like it's not it's not like the same as in like the us and other countries where it like became a thing like um in terms of the language the first year was really tough but i did learn uh japanese in the us first and then when I was here, it was like a very immersive program. And then I was also working part time and everyone was just speaking Japanese all the time. So the first year was tough, uh, but every year after that got a little easier. Um, obviously, I'm not a native speaker, but I feel pretty comfortable where I'm at now. Uh, I can do my taxes and stuff. And so then I'm good. <laughs> Let's see. Now, someone told me the baths are all natural. How do you know in advance if that's the case? By all natural, do you mean like uh, uh, going in nude? 
so in Japan, uh, most of the baths are. However, there are some where they let you wear a swimsuit. Uh, you could always look it up ahead of time. I think with more people coming from abroad, there are more places that cater to foreigners who are not used to that. But there, if it is all natural, it's all the same gender. So they have like the women's section and the men's section. However, I have run into some old school that the public baths where the changing room between the men and women, like you could totally see the other side. <laughs> they didn't used to be gender separated. That, that happened um, a little later. Let's see, anonymous. What are your top amusement parks to enjoy? Uh, there's Universal Studios in Osaka, it's good. And then I, I have a thing for like retro and sort of rundown places. There's another one outside Osaka um, in Ikoma, which is like a mountain. And it's on the peak of the mountain. It's like the oldest extant amusement park in Japan. So <laughs> it's free to go in and walk through. I just like looking at all the old stuff. Uh, Mary Yasker, I'm going to Japan late March, early April. What is the weather and possibility of seeing the cherry blossoms? Um, Actually, you have a great time, late March, early April, that's when they're at their peak. So you should be fine as long as you're in the, uh, either the Tokyo area or the Kyoto, Osaka area. Lena McKinney, what are the most popular or most seen animals in Japan? Uh, it's not like the US where you have rabbits everywhere. So not uh, as many wild animals that you see in the city. Uh, I've seen some raccoons, apparently they're invasive. It's also the raccoon dogs. They're like a relative of the fox, sort of. They they look like raccoons, but they're dogs. They're they're a canine. Um, right now, Japan has an issue with too many deer and too many wild boars <laughs> uh, because they don't have any natural predators left. Uh, Chantel de Souza. Also, have you tried fugu? Is it worth it? I have tried it. Um, I didn't die. Um, whether or not it's worth it, you should try it once. Uh, the flavor is very subtle. <laughs> it doesn't have much of like its own flavor. Par Paul Arredondo, from all the immigrants that decide to live in Japan permanently, which nationality would you say is the most recurrent? Um, I think according to census data, it's mostly people uh, who are either from mainland China or Taiwan, mostly mainland China though. And then in some places, uh, Koreans, although a lot of the people who are lumped in with Koreans are part of a group called Zainichi Koreans who aren't like, they didn't just come from Korea yesterday. They're, they're, they're the descendants of the either people who came to Japan to work blue collar jobs during World War II or the, uh, or the late 1800s or those who came over as like descendants of the slave labor that came over, like one of the two. And then after World War II, it didn't take long for the Korean War to happen and things just got all sorts of crazy. Uh, but they're the descendants and they were never considered, even the descendants were never considered Japanese. So that's a big controversial issue in Japan. Uh, I think it's easier now to get your Japanese citizenship if you're part of that group um, than before. The other major group is Brazilians actually, that'd be the other one. Uh, Trevor Dossett, given current international travel restrictions, when do you think Japan will open up? For Australian people to travel. I know I want you guys to come, but uh, I have no idea. <laughs> Anonymous, are the majority of people in Japan religious? Uh, I would say no, not that much, but there are definitely religious people as well. Irish, when did Japan get independence? Well, Japan was always Japan. It never had like a foreign power ruling it, except for that short period after World War II for a few years when the US occupied Japan. So I guess the 1950s, if you want to go that route. But Okinawa was owned by America as a colony until 1972, who knew? Uh, so Okinawa only became a part of Japan again later. Okinawa was its own country, it, uh, own culture, own language and everything. Uh, Anna Nemirovsky, in the Japanese paintings, people often look vicious. Would you happen to know why? Um, if you're talking about the one I showed like with the samurai uh, family, of course they want to look tough and scary. Uh, there are also paintings of like the, I guess, the the demons or like, the, or whatnot when they're trying to show a bad guy as well. But for the warlords and stuff, they wanted to look tough and ferocious, you know, scare the enemies. Anonymous, how much Japanese should you learn before going to Japan? Depends what you're going to Japan for. Um, if you're coming here to learn Japanese, uh, I would suggest getting a grasp on the basic grammar first. Uh, your ear will adjust later. <laughs> but if you're just here to visit, 
just know like a few basic phrases. I mean, a lot of people get by without knowing any Japanese if you're just a visitor, but if you want to live, I would put in the effort. Heidi Fletcher, are there koi gardens to visit? Oh, they're everywhere. Anywhere with like a Japanese garden with a pond. Uh, Christine Chase Hockey, is local public transport expensive or bullet train expensive? Petrol prices if you wanted to hire a car. The car is definitely going to be more expensive, but um, the trains, I think, are on the more expensive side. But if you're coming on a tourist visa, you can get the Japan Rail Pass and that can save you a lot of money. Ken Stranger, why is it so hard to find decaffeinated coffee there? I asked the same question. Alexis Betters, uh, what is the building in the picture? The one that's on the picture right now, that's actually Byodoin, that's in um, Uji. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Hala Bloom, we had a Japanese exchange student in 1999 through 2000. Loved him dearly and I'm still in contact with him. Oh, that's nice. Uh, I've talked with him about a somewhat extended trip to visit him and tour Japan. He lives in Mido City in Ibaraki. I would stay in that area to visit him and plan tours from there. Are small studio apartments available for vacation rentals in most areas? Where do we find information about how much for that cost? Is it feasible to plan your own tours or better to pay for group tours? How's COVID affected being able to travel to Japan at this time? That's a lot of questions. Ibaraki, um, that's, that's on the uh, northeast side of the country. So uh, it would be nice. I think you can go to a lot of uh, really beautiful rural areas, um, see some like tea plantations. Uh, you could probably go to Tokyo as well. Um, however, uh, it's gonna depend on how Airbnb works after COVID. I know Japan's always trying to regulate Airbnb. So I have no idea, but Ibaraki shouldn't be like that expensive. It's not like, it's not Tokyo. <laughs> Uh, I would imagine it's cheaper. Uh, anonymous, do you like Bakuno Hero Academia? Um, okay, I'm sorry, I haven't actually watched it yet. I know it's really famous and popular right now. Uh, Marie Lavance, are there people buried in or next to the shrines? Sometimes, but usually not, because shrines like death is like very taboo at shrines. Uh, usually they'll be buried at temples. Um, anonymous, why did you not visit the maid cafe? I've been to May Cafe twice, um, once, and then, yeah, the first time I was curious, the second time I went because I had some cousins come visit me in Japan and they're like, it's like, why not? Um, I don't know, I just wasn't feeling it. Marie Lavox, have you experienced the toilets that are flat to the floor? Oh, the squat toilets? Yes, the Japanese toilets. Your stay is not complete without having both the best and the worst toilets. Andrea Williams, what are, the best places to stay, hotels or Airbnbs, um, again, depends on the city. There's lots of hotels that are very reasonably priced. Nancy Bryan, what type of sign language do Japanese individuals who are deaf use? There is a Japanese sign language, so it's different from American sign language and British sign language. So they have their own sign language. Sign language is just like any other language. Um, another topic for another time, but it evolves just like spoken language where you get slang and things branch off and you get like different language families. It's really interesting. But yeah, Japan has its own. Um, anonymous, what time is it in your area? I have no idea. I've lost track of time. Oh my gosh, it's 11.31. I'm sorry for all of those on the East Coast. It must be very late for you. Anonymous, can you hike Mount Fuji? Um, depends on the time of the year. Don't, uh, you're not allowed to do it in the winter or fall. It's like just the summer that you can actually get to the top Otherwise, it's too dangerous. Anonymous, do you buy Gashapon capsule toys? Oh, I had a few. Like, so uh, Gashapon are like vending machines, but you get a toy. It's like a, a mystery box. You don't know what's inside, and you get like little tchotchkes. Yeah, they're everywhere as well. Knock yourself out. Mary Kern, what is your favorite art gallery in Tokyo? Oh, there's like the National Art Museum. Oh, gosh, I'm so old school. <laughs> uh, but they also have like the new one I haven't had a chance to visit yet. They have some, they have like ones that, they have like a science museum as well that I liked as well. Uh, Nancy Brennerman, when we went to Japan in 1985 on official business, we had to bring 50 small gifts. <laughs> Is that a tradition still done in Japan? Uh, probably referring to omiyage culture or souvenir culture. Uh, yes, I'm sorry that it had to be 50 like small individual gifts. Most people here, they like, everywhere you go is like catered towards omiyage, so you can just get like a big box of like individually wrapped food, something, and then you can just like pass it out to everyone. Just get it over with. Uh, Jamie Smilowitz, can you tell me something about Katsura Castle? Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'll have to sort of refresh my memory on that. 
Uh, let's see another one. I read that tattoos are not well seen in the public. Do you recommend using clothes that cover tattoos when visiting? Um, if you're obviously a foreigner, it's not too much of a problem, but there's definitely discrimination, especially when it comes to the uh, owns of the public baths. Uh, but it's slowly changing, slowly, slowly changing. Paul, are there those? Sorry, I forgot to mention that I'm from Canada. When is the cheapest time to visit Osaka, Hiroshima, and Kyoto? Um, I'm not sure about plane prices from Canada, but the off season would probably be winter for those three areas. Dan Royce, you have been there for seven years. Have you figured out the cute culture? Am I not cute to you? I'm so offended, Diane. Uh, sorry. Um, but cute. I mean, I don't really think about it that much, to be honest. Uh, Celine Toth, what are common customs one should be aware of when traveling to Japan? Um, I mean, people do the bow thing a lot, but yeah, common customs, I'm sure. Like, just don't be rude, be, just don't be a bad person. I, I think that can help you a lot. <laughs> don't stress it too much. Anonymous, have you ever watched Sakura Card Captor? I used to, I read some of the manga at some point. I know it's a classic. Maybe if Corona keeps on going the way it's going, I'm going to have to watch all the anime because so I'm going to have all the time in the world. Kylie Brown, amazing. Thanks for your time. You are doing so good answering these questions so quickly. I'm doing my best. Thank you, Kylie. Um, Kira Raku, any resources you recommend for learning Japanese for beginners? I think I answered that before, but the Genki and Nakama textbooks and also the YouTube channel. Nihongo no Mori. I love Nihongo no Mori. Uh, they have everything from beginner to advanced. Anonymous, what is the brand name of Okonomiyaki sauce in the bottle? Oh, uh, shoot. I have to look at the picture again. I'm sorry, but I recognize, I recognize it. The face. I, think, I want to say otafuku. I think it's otafuku. Uh, Michael Amowitz, you have done a wonderful job covering so much history, culture, and geography. This has been very... Enjoyable, domo arigato, both of you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Linda Simcoe, informative and enjoyable presentation, especially good at answering questions quickly. Well, I have a lot of experience <laughs> doing tours. It becomes a part of the job description. Uh, Anonymous, have you been to Okinawa? How does it differ from Japan? It's on my to-go list that with Corona, I don't know when that's gonna happen. It's very far from the mainland. Uh, Nancy Brennerman, Japan is a very ethnically heterogeneous heterogeneous uh, country. I've heard that there's great animosity towards the Chinese. Is this true? Okay, so that's a very complicated question. There's definitely racism. There's like a three-way racism thing between China, Korea, and Japan, and like everybody hates each other. It's like Korea and China hate Japan, and Japan hates China and Korea, but sometimes likes China. It's, it's confusing. I'm just really happy I'm not Japanese and I don't have to be involved in all that drama. Um, but I would challenge the everyone being the same thing. I know that's like the thing that everyone says, but you just have to travel around Japan and you will see there's so many dialects. There is also different cultures and foods. That's not even talking about um, the uh, indigenous people that I knew who are now mostly in Hokkaido and the Ryukyuans who are mostly in Okinawa. There is a lot of diversity that I think often gets overlooked. Um, Anonymous, have you had one of the expensive $150 melons? No, but if you want to buy one for me, I will gladly indulge. Alice Grossman, are there cemeteries in Japan? Yes, uh, by law, you have to be cremated here. And most of the cemeteries are on in Buddhist temples. So there's a saying that you're born Shinto and die Buddhist because <laughs> all, the, all the being born is all the happy stuff is at the Shinto shrines. And when you die, all that stuff happens at the temple. Um, Richard Sinta, what are the hazards of eating fish that might have radioactivity? How is this dealt with by restaurants or government? Uh, they do have regulations for the amount of radiation in food. Uh, so most people just never think about it, to be honest. Um, I don't think it's something that really needs to be worried about. Uh, Red meat, can you explain about Japanese occupation of China? So it wasn't the whole of China. So originally it was just Manchuria and then like it kind of spread out a bit. Uh, but there were definitely a lot of war atrocities that were committed by the uh, Japanese occupying forces. So pretty much what happened was, so Manchuria was a colony and there was a military coup in Japan, but they started the coup in Manchuria. So they had like a false flag operation pretty much where they blew up a train 
and that pretty much helped turn the tide to make Japan like a military dictatorship. And also in China and many other places, there are places with like human experimentation and other horrible things and like the rape of Nanking. Uh, lots of horrible things happened. And I don't think that's something that can be looked over. Um, yeah, but I don't think a lot of people who were living in Japan at the time knew exactly what was happening um, over there, if that makes sense. Was, is it easy for a single woman to travel? And you go, I think it's really easy. I've, I travel by myself a lot. Um, anonymous, is it true? There is a type of fish in Tokyo that if it's not cooked properly, you can die. That's just Tokyo everywhere. That's the fugu fish. But the good news is, uh, I, I think it's been many years since someone's died from it. You have to have a license. And it's one of, I think it's like the most difficult license to get to be able to prepare fugu fish. Um, most of the hospitalizations happen from people who fish the fugu fish and they don't know how to prepare it properly and they mess up on their fishing boat. But if you're in a restaurant, you're totally fine. Um, and also, what are the anime locations an anime fan can visit when tours Japan? Like everywhere. <laughs> I know Totori Prefecture has a lot. They have like Detective Conan is there. Um, let's see. I know like Kyoto is a big place. Tokyo is a big place pretty much anywhere is trying to like really advertise their anime connection now. Emily Rogers, I was in Japan 1999. I loved how safe it felt even riding the train late at night as a single woman. Is it still like that? And the Alps are wonderful. Kamakura was my favorite. So I love Kamakura. Have you been there? Kamakura, amazing. Uh, I still, it still feels pretty safe. Like obviously nothing is like 100%, but I think compared to most countries in the world, like traveling by yourself as a woman here is really easy and stress-free. I guess you can get almost too used to it. Uh, Richard Sinta, I've heard there are places that were abandoned that people invited to move to to help repopulate them. <laughs> this is sort of true, actually. Actually, I went to, there's a, a village in Nara, not Nara City, not the place I showed, but there's like a village that uh, they get their tax money to uh, host people to come there and they try and get you to like, be interested in purchasing the abandoned houses there for really cheap. <laughs> but there's a lot of abandoned houses and some cities and villages have initiatives. Uh, the Golden Temple book, it is called the Temple of the Golden Pavilion. Oh my gosh, I think I finished them all. You did it, you did it. You got through them all. Thank you so much, Marty. And thank you so much for everyone for for sending your questions and staying on so long. It's always great. I love the Q&A portion because I think there's so many things that come out that you don't necessarily get to know. And you certainly showed your expertise, Marty, in the Q&A. It's amazing that you know all of the information you do and it just comes out so naturally. So thank you very much. Um, so Everyone, this is it. I know all, th all good things must come to an end, but this is it for mm -hmm. all of us. I want to thank Marty again. And Marty, you can say goodbye, and then we will uh, head off for, for a day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you again for having me. This was really fun. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>